Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Give me a quick sound check. One, two, one, two. How are you all doing? Welcome to another stream. It is good to be back here. I've been doing this a little more frequently as of late, and it's always a good time. We're going to have a lot of fun this evening. I see a lot of folks coming from so many different places. We have, what do we have? Where do we have? Where, where are we in the chat? People are saying the audio is fine. We have Austin, Texas. We have Ontario, Canada. We have Serbia, great. Baltimore, Chicago. So we're coming from the Collective West. We're coming from around the world. Really good to be with all of you today. We have Portugal here really early in the morning. Um, a lot of exciting things happening. A lot of exciting things to announce. But let's get started. How about that? And then we can take some breaks in between the content. So you know what to do. Just a few things before we get started. Hit that like button, okay? That's how we get more people into this stream here. We have a wide-ranging conversation. We're going to talk about the she Zelensky call. We're going to talk about the embarrassing. I mean, I mean, all of this is embarrassing when it comes to the Collective West, but the embarrassing U.S.-South Korea summit. We're also going to talk about how Russia, through its ability to integrate globally as well as its own reforms has been able to beat back the effort of the collective west to isolate it on the world stage that's what we have going on tonight so to get more people to hear this to see this hit that like button it is the free and most effective free way to support this work now my birthday is in one week from tomorrow and i told myself I need to get on this equipment overhaul. I have procrastinated enough and have attempted to save up as much as I can, but I do need your help. So in order to replace my computer device, in order to get additional equipment to upgrade this channel, please do subscribe at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. There are annual memberships available. That link is in the description. You can also subscribe annually on Substack, which is also in the description. Be sure to subscribe for free, if anything, because that's how you can get notified without having to rely solely on YouTube. You can also become a YouTube member here for $4.99 per month. All of these paid memberships come with the ability to suggest guests as questions of guests. And we have some good ones that I'm trying to get on here and that I am going to get on here coming up soon in the month of May. So I'm going to announce that at the end of, to, at the end of this stream. But please do support this channel if you are so able. So welcome to my international audience. Welcome to all the moderators. Thank you. Thank you already to Member Valley for that super sticker. Very generous. Also, for those who are catching this on the replay, I am going to put timestamps after this stream is over. So if you're watching this on the replay, go to the link, go to those timestamps in the description and you can find your way to the content that you want to see and you can skip over the theme song if you don't want to wait through that and all of that good stuff so welcome to the members i see janine welcome to the moderators i see aloha i see desert mantis i see many others thank you for coming out this evening reminder hit that like button we have 239 likes 459 watching let's get up to 300 400 likes how about in the next 10 minutes? Is that uh, 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 is that doable? I hope so. Anyway, let's get to the first topic, shall we? So it happened, okay? Finally, Zelensky was able to make contact with China, was able to speak with Chinese President Xi Jinping. This happened just a few days ago. And in this call, we had... Uh, important content, of course. China is going to send a special envoy to deliberate on peace with Ukraine, as well as several other parties involved in the conflict. Of course, Ukraine also had some business matters. It had to uh, appoint a new ambassador. And, and there was relatively cordial conversation between the two, with Zelensky encouraging the Chinese role in the peace process, which some would say, oh, well, that's a good thing, right? Well, we have to look at this a little deeper. I think, number one, this call signifies what the U.S. has become, which is an irrelevant empire in decline. 
China did not bother to deliberate with the United States. It's not even taking Joe Biden's phone call. And uh, uh, Antony Blinken, who supposedly was set to visit China uh, uh, earlier uh, in the winter, late in the winter, early spring, did not has not been able to go to Beijing. Why? Well, you guessed it, the whole Chinese balloon incident, and then over and over and over again, more and more issues diplomatically with the United States. Now with this whole Chinese police station, McCarthyist business. So they're not talking. In China, Xi Jinping and the rest, they are not interested in the U.S. and what the U.S. has to say. They are talking to Zelensky directly. And this comes after, of course, the historic summit between Putin and Xi Jinping in Moscow. And I think it's really important to note that not only is the U.S. on the sidelines for all of this, but Xi Jinping and Putin met together first, talked about this first, and now without even any plans set for a visit from Zelensky or a visit to Ukraine by Xi Jinping, we know what the reality is. And that is Zelensky is being treated exactly how he should be treated, which is as a secondary player in all of this, as someone who has always been a puppet of the U.S. and the collective West. And Xi Jinping and China is saying, well, it's time to warn you about what is about to happen. You're going to be defeated, right? This is not in the readout. This isn't it, how China talks. But you know that the reason why this is happening now is because there is this vaunted, much heralded upcoming counteroffensive that even Ukraine is saying is very much in peril, whether it's because it needs to be delayed for weapons shortages or whether it's just because on the battlefield, not much is going to change no matter what Ukraine does, even if it makes any advances. So China knows this. China knows this conflict needs to end. China knows this conflict as uh, much as it has provided opportunities to the global south to unite and come together, it has also caused much instability worldwide and, of course, has increased the threat of confrontation between uh, uh, the collective West, the United States in particular, NATO in particular, with Russia and, of course, also China, that these dangers need to be uh, controlled and contained and there needs to be progress on the peace front. And China has told Zelensky in this call that it will be the mediator. It does not want to do it on Washington's terms. It's not going to do it on NATO's terms. And it's not going to do it on Zelensky's terms. It's going to do it on the terms of who is the true leader right now worldwide. That's not the United States. It's on any NATO country or EU country, but it's China. And Russia is right alongside with it. So with that said, everyone, I'm going to put on the Duran's analysis, I'm going to react to the Duran's analysis now of this because they had very interesting things to say. And uh, I want to also then play or read, I should say, the Global Times editorial that they reference because I think it is the most instructive on what actually happened in this call because we don't often hear the Chinese side. We get really strange takes from the collective West and its corporate media, right? We get all these takes from, oh, well, this is all a ploy to give Russia more time, right? That uh, uh, China is just trying to uh, seize on its hot streak of peace, anything to deny the legitimacy of Chinese leadership. But the, the folks at the Duran, friends at the Duran had this to say, okay, let me actually fast forward to the 11 second mark where they start talking about the call. And let's get started. I'll stop periodically. We'll listen to just a short amount of this. Zelensky finally got the call that he's been asking for, some would say begging for, a couple of quick quick thoughts. Uh, Xi Jinping still has not uh, talked to Biden. He doesn't want to talk to Biden. Uh, he is not letting Anthony Blinken travel to Beijing. He doesn't want to see Anthony Blinken in Beijing. He said that he will talk to Zelensky, when the time is right, something along those lines says, when the time is right, I will uh, accept a call from Zelensky. And I think we're going to talk about the Global Times and how they um, how they analyze this phone call, because the analysis from the collective West media is is crap. 
absolutely. You're I, know, I, I was about to use a very bad, uh, an even an even worse word, but but I'll just label it label it as crap. I'll call it crap because they're coming up with all kinds of strange theories, ranging from China is trying to buy time for Russia, all the way to China is desperate to to continue its uh, partnership with the EU. So they're trying to to kiss to kiss up to Alensky. I mean. They're coming out with all kinds of bizarre, wacko theories. But I think if you really want to find out the the essence, the the purpose of this call, you have to go to to Chinese state media. That's my opinion. Absolutely. And Absolutely. the Global Times is is the best source Glo- for that. Global Times that they've done an editorial about it and they've given an article. And by the way, over the last few hours, the Chinese foreign ministry has now provided a readout. And the readout is extremely interesting extremely interesting indeed now let's just first of all hold on to that first point that you made um xi jinping he won't talk to joe biden he won't receive uh blinken in beijing uh, the chinese defense ministry won't pick up the phone when lloyd austin calls all of these people are still in the you know, china won't deal with any of these people at all they prefer to deal with Zelensky of all people. I mean, you know, Biden has been relegated by China to a level below Zelensky. I mean, that is incredible. That is deeply, deeply insulting, if you think about it, to the US. So first things first, this was a telephone call, not a virtual meeting, certainly not any kind of summit, no suggestion Zelensky's getting an invitation to Beijing. The second is the time is right. Why is the time right now? Ukraine is about to launch its offensive. There's been a whole host of articles. There was a new one. There's a new one, by the way, this morning on the BBC about Ukraine, its army being exhausted, it being out of ammunition. The BBC says that, you know, when they launch multiple rocket launchers, they used to have they used to be able to launch 40 rockets at, at a time. Now they can only launch two. They found a book missile, uh, you know, surface-to-air missile um, station. It's only got two missiles instead of four. And the operator says that they can't maintain it because they can't get spare parts. So it's almost out of commission. The Ukrainian defense minister, Reznikov, has just issued a statement, says that they're completely out essentially out of S-300 missiles, which was their major uh, their major weapon system. The BBC again says that they're having to ration ammunition because they're out of ammunition. Another Ukrainian soldier tells the BBC, Ukraine is exhausted. So all of this on the eve of an offensive. So what does Xi Jinping do? He comes along, he has this telephone call with Zelensky. I just want to pause it there, actually, because, I mean, that's that's just the reality. You don't think China follows these developments? You don't think China is well aware that Ukraine's situation is not favorable right now? No, this is all about China following this conflict very closely, understanding the balance of forces. The situation is not favorable to Ukraine. This counteroffensive is likely only going to cause more damage to Ukraine militarily, economically, on and on and on. China does not want to see more fighting. So, of course, the time is right here now that you have both the Western media and you have Ukrainian officials saying, hey, we're not going to succeed unless we get more. Well, China is saying, well, you can succeed in another way, and that is ending the hostilities, stopping this absolutely ridiculous war, this ridiculous conflict, which is only going to cause more pain for you, and it's not going to end well. So how about you follow our lead and look at what we've done? Look at what we've done with Saudi Arabia and Iran. There's a lot that we can do to help you. All right, let's continue. He says a number of things, and you you need to go to the readout. The readout is actually incredibly interesting. He says, you know, we've, we've got a partnership with you, which has been going on for a long time. It's been based on mutual agreement on topics like sovereignty and territorial integrity. Now, notice the word mutual, because what 
Xi Jinping is doing there is he's warning Zelensky. The Americans are trying to get Taiwan into some form of independence. You've up to now supported the one China policy. Don't even think about changing that. We will not be happy if you do. This strategic partnership that we've had with you for 31 years now depends on that. It, you, you are, you know, you're in real danger if you do this. And then he goes on and talks to Zelensky and he says, look, you need to talk to the Russians. You need an immediate ceasefire. You need negotiations to start now. And you also need to consider that peace in Ukraine can only be achieved within a general reorganization of the strategic landscape in Europe. So that is what Xi Jinping actually said to Zelensky, according to the Chinese readout. So the Chinese basically telling Zelensky, look, you're, in, you're, in, you're on your last throw, you're out of ammunition, your men are tired, you can't win this war. This um, article in the BBC actually has Ukrainian soldiers telling the BBC, if they don't win this year, in this offensive, they're not going to win at all. So Xi Jinping telling Zelensky all of this, says negotiate now, sit down with the Russians now, agree peace, but that peace has to be essentially on our terms and Russia's terms and not on America's terms or Europe's terms. And if you're thinking of follow your American friends over Taiwan, we're no longer your friends. Yeah, uh, that's what it was. <laughs> so I'm going to get to the readout, actually. Let me let me transition to that, because I think that's really important here. Um, I, I mean, that's exactly right. Right. That, that, that's exactly right. That's a, that, China knows how to do this. Right. It has already shown with the Saudi Arabia, Iran deal and how it has built up this comprehensive strategic partnership with Russia and how it has just deliberated with countries all around the world on economic cooperation, cultural cooperation, cooperation of all kinds. This has lent it to be prepared for this moment. And Ukraine is in the opposite position. Ukraine is isolating itself by snuggling in the bosom of the collective West, by saying, we will be your pawn in a war on Russia. And by doing that, Ukraine has been essentially obliterated. And so now Zelensky has to listen to China at some point. But that's the warning here. The warning is, if you do not listen to us, if you don't follow along with what makes the most sense for you, then you will only be harmed further. And not only that, if you're just not if you're selfish, then you won't consider the fact that it's not just you being harmed. It's the entire world. It's a world economy. It's Europe. This destructive proxy war led by the United States, led by NATO, is absolutely causing immense damage. And Ukraine is on the forefront of that damage. So th that's what Xi Jinping said. And now it's time for Ukraine, for Zelensky to heed that warning. And I like how the Duran talked about Taiwan here because China is not unaware of the significance of Taiwan in all of this. Taiwan is the proxy war 2.0 for the United States against China this time. And Ukraine is kind of a testing ground for what it might look like to wage a similar proxy war on China through Taiwan. So China is using its leverage with Ukraine and saying, do not even think about going over to the U.S. side on the Taiwan question because we will no longer be partners with you in the same way. We will bring consequences. China will pull back on investment. You don't think Ukraine needs China for any kind of rebuilding efforts with however territorially Ukraine should look after this conflict finally subsides whenever that may be? It needs China. China is an incredibly important partner to Ukraine. Ukraine is a 
country is a BRI country. It's a Belt and Road Initiative country. And before the coup in 2014, things looked pretty promising between Ukraine and China. And it's only deteriorated since then to the point where China was not ready and not party to treating Ukraine as some kind of equal to Russia in this sense. Because on the one hand, Russia has been a reliable friend. Russia has stood by its word. Russia has matched its word with deed throughout this conflict period, dating from 2014 onward. And Ukraine has done the opposite. And so this is going to happen on China's terms. China is not going to allow Ukraine to, in any kind of peace negotiations, demand uh, territorial changes, for example, like reacquiring Ukraine, I mean, reacquiring Crimea or something absolutely out of the question. No, Russia and Ukraine will have to come to a settlement that works for all sides and that respects the interests and the needs of all sides in this conflict. And China will be there to mediate it, just like it did with Saudi Arabia and Iran. You think Saudi Arabia and Iran got everything that they wanted? No, they didn't. But they knew that there's this Yemen war quagmire that needs to be resolved. There's a lot of business that needs to get done in the region. There's a lot of economic activity that's being hurt by the U.S.'s hegemony and its absolute interference in the region. So it's time to put aside differences and cooperate on what we can agree on. That's what China will be expecting from Ukraine. And that's what it will be expecting from Russia and all parties. But it can rely more on Russia, of course, than it can Ukraine. Because what has Ukraine done but follow the U.S. side all along? So let's read that uh, Chinese readout of the call. I have it up. It's from the foreign ministry, China's foreign ministry here. All right. So I'm actually going to change. Let me change the format here so it's a little more visible and I can zoom in actually a little bit. Let's see. All right. It's zoomed in a, a good amount. So this is the readout. President Xi Jinping speaks with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky on the phone. On April 26th of April, President Xi Jinping spoke with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky on the phone at the invitation of the latter. The two sides exchanged views on Ukraine-China relations and the Ukraine crisis. So you heard that? The latter, meaning that it was Zelensky that made the call and it was China that picked up. That's important. This wasn't China saying, all right, I'm going to pick up your call. I'm going to call you right now because I, I you're a priority here. No, it was Ukraine saying, let's let's talk. Let's talk about this peace agreement thing. Things are getting a little dicey here. The, uh, so President Xi noted that China-Ukraine relations after 31 years of development have reached a high level of strategic partnership, boosting development and revitalization of the two countries. She commended Zelensky for stating on multiple occasions the importance he attaches to developing a bilateral relationship and advancing cooperation with China and thanked Ukraine for its strong assistance in the evacuation of Chinese nationals last year. Mutual respect and sovereignty and territorial integrity is the political foundation of China-Ukraine relations. The two sides need to look to the future, view and handle bilateral relations from a long-term perspective, carry forward the tradition of mutual respect and sincerity, and take the China-Ukraine strategic partnership forward. China's readiness to develop relations with Ukraine is consistent and clear-cut. No matter how the international situation evolves, China will work with Ukraine to advance mutually beneficial cooperation. So this is important. This is the most important thing for me. Mutual respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity is the political foundation, meaning both sides, meaning don't get silly. Don't get silly, Ukraine. You need to understand that if you're going to work with us, if there's going to be any hope for peace, if there's going to be any hope for real, genuine leadership and cooperation with us around peace, you better believe that you need to respect our territorial integrity because we know what has been happening in this war and that this war is a lot about violating territorial integrity and not just because Russia conducted a special military operation, but because Ukraine has huge aims to take uh, majority Russian-speaking, Russian-populated areas from Russia on behalf of NATO. Believe that. Believe that China understands that. The two sides need to look to the future. View. Uh, okay, so I read that. President Xi pointed out that the Ukraine crisis is evolving in complex ways with major impacts on the international landscape. On the Ukraine crisis, 
China always stands on the side of peace. Its core stance is to facilitate peace talks. He noted his proposals of four points of what must be done, four things the international community must do together in three observations. On this basis, China released its position on the political settlement of the Ukraine crisis. China did not create the Ukraine crisis, nor is it a party to it. As a permanent member of the UN Security Council and a responsible major country, China would not sit idly by, nor would it add fuel to the fire, still less exploit the situation for self-gains. Everything China does is above board. Dialogue and negotiation are the only way forward that are viable. There is no winner in nuclear wars. On the nuclear issue, all relevant parties must stay calm and exercise restraint, truly act in the interests of their own future and that of humanity, and jointly manage the crisis. With rational thinking and voices now on the rise, it is important to seize the opportunity and build up favorable conditions for the political settlement of the crisis. So here you go. Everything China does is above board. It is saying, China's foreign ministry is saying, Xi Jinping was saying in this call that China is transparent. China is honest here. China has done exactly what you would expect a major country to do in a situation of conflict, which is not pour fuel on the fire, not take any kind of side in the conflict, but to navigate the conflict in its own best interests, in the interests of humanity. And it has been very clear about what that is. And that is a political settlement to this crisis and not politicizing this war to try to, and this is, I think, a response to how the U.S. has spoken about this conflict and has spoken about China. This is a response to all of that propaganda saying China's sending weapons, China's working with Russia. No, China's saying we will relate to the players in this conflict in a way that is honest, in a way that is beneficial to everyone. Would it be beneficial for China to try to isolate Russia with the U.S.? No, it would hurt the world economy more. It would hurt China and it would hurt the collective West in the United States, believe it or not, even though they are too boneheaded and idiotic and stupid to believe that and understand it. So China knows what has to be done. And that's a political settlement on this crisis. And it says right here, there are no winners in nuclear war. That is very direct from Xi Jinping saying no. If you decide to continue this war, you are provoking the nuclear question and there could be a nuclear proliferation. It's already happening. NATO is all about that. China is well aware of all of this. Believe it. So with rational thinking and voices now on the... Okay. So it is hoped that all parties would seriously reflect on the Ukraine crisis and jointly explore ways to bring lasting peace and security to Europe through dialogue. China will continue to facilitate talks for peace and make efforts for early ceasefire and restoration of peace. China will send the special representative of the Chinese government of New Asian Affairs to Ukraine and other countries to have in-depth communication with all parties on the political sentiment of the crisis. China has sent multiple batches of humanitarian assistance to Ukraine and will keep providing help to the best of its ability. Zelensky here, so you see very little Zelensky in this readout. Zelensky congratulated Xi on his re-election and commended China for its remarkable achievements. He expressed confidence that under the leadership of President Xi, China will, uh, will successfully address various challenges and continue to move forward. China opposed the purposes and principles of the UN Charter and international affairs and has significant influence on the international stage. The Ukraine side is committed to the One China policy and hopes to advance all around bilateral cooperation with China, open up a new chapter in Ukraine-China relations, and jointly safeguard peace and stability. Ha ha ha, right? Zelensky shared his view on the current state of the Ukraine crisis. He thanked China for the humanitarian assistance to Ukraine and welcomed China's important role in restoring peace and seeking diplomatic solutions to the crisis. While I laughed there because it's funny, because Ukraine is not interested in that at all, at least in terms of its current political uh, um, formation, its government, it is very interesting to note that Ukraine, Zelensky, was very clear to walk the Chinese line. He was not going to go against what President Xi has laid out for Ukraine. And that is an interesting development, right? An interesting development that the U.S. side, NATO, the puppeteers pulling Zelensky's puppet strings had no ability to influence Zelensky's words in this process, in this call. And that is very telling of where the United States, where the collective West in particular is. It is not in a situation to successfully 
negotiate, broker, or even influence, because we're talking about influence here. We're not just talking about uh, whether something will happen or whether it won't. We're talking about, let me actually get this off the screen. We're talking about how Zelensky was compelled to affirm the one China principle as the very first thing that he said in response to President Xi Jinping's comments. He said, we affirm the one China principle. Why do you think that is? It's because any hesitation on that is a red line and a non-starter for China. And Zelensky is obviously eyeing Chinese assistance for something. Of course, Ukraine, even as their government is currently constituted, needs, it's not even about wanting, it's about needing Chinese economic assistance and cooperation. That's no question. But it also stands to uh, be that Zelensky has to toe the line politically with China because there's obviously something brewing. There is something brewing in the background here. And that is the reality of this conflict that we have been talking about on this channel since the beginning that I have talked about on other channels. I've been on the Duran. The Duran's been on here. Brian berletic has been on here. All the geopolitics community, Pepe Escobar, all of them have said the same thing. Scott Ritter, we've all been saying the same thing. We've been saying that this conflict is in Russia's favor. It's Russia's to lose and it's Ukraine's to, um, and, and, and it's Russia's to win and it's Ukraine's to lose. And that's the trajectory that is not going to change. So Zelensky knows that because whether it's Zeluzhny, whether it's Reznikov, whether it's Zelensky himself, they've all sounded the alarm at some point in the last six months since they've been talking about this counteroffensive, give us a new army, give us more weapons, all of this. In the last half a year, since they've been grading about it and complaining about it and whining about it, it's all because they know that the conflict is not going in their favor. Bakhmut is not going in their favor. It's uh, uh, almost 100% in Russia's possession now. And this is only going to continue to happen. A cascade effect. Russia's in pretty good shape right now. And Ukraine is not. Ukraine is not. This is what you'll never hear in the collective West media, right? They don't talk about Ukraine suffering. Ukraine isn't doing well right now. Ukraine economically is a basket case. It has been looted and plundered like any other neo-colony. It has been parasitically looted and plundered. And then you have a war going on as well. That is absolutely torturous. Ukraine was already one of the poorest countries in the region, and now it has been completely demolished because of NATO. And that means that China is even more important. And China is saying, well, we got you. We can get you out of this, but you're going to have to do it on our terms. You're going to have to do it with respect to Russia, and you're going to have to do it without the influence and the um, you you know, and the absolute disrespect and hegem hegemonic ambitions of your puppet master, the United States and NATO, the collective West. That's what Xi Jinping said. It's just the truth. It's the reality of the situation. And we need to continue to follow this development because it points to, it points to something that I think we all can agree on. And that is that there is only one settlement. There's only one option to end this conflict, and that is peace, right? And it'll happen in some way or another, whether Russia just totally gains victory, right? Whatever that looks like for them, because I think it's still in, open to the conditions as they change. But I think victory would be protection of the Donbass as well as a political situation that's favorable to that. But it's still up for a debate, not necessarily in words, but the conditions on the ground will change because NATO has, de has designated this conflict a permanent war, meaning that, yeah, it could go nuclear. China's aware of that. China warns Zelensky. China warns Zelensky on a lot of things here. Don't disrespect us. Don't go against our territorial integrity and our sovereignty around Taiwan. And listen up. Listen up to what a real adult in the room is telling you. And that is that 
this conflict is not going to end well for you. It's time to talk to Russia. It's time to get all the parties involved to begin a ceasefire and a restoration of peace and to begin enforcement mechanisms uh, in creating enforcement mechanisms to make it happen. China is the only country that's able to do this. And it just shows how irrelevant the collective West in the United States in particular has become on this issue. And it's the one that instigated this war in the first place. So an incredibly important breaking development. We got to keep following it. And I'm sure there will be follow up steps from here, as you already heard from the readout that a Chinese envoy is going to be going around talking to all the countries that it believes are a party to this conflict to begin this process. Really exciting, really encouraging, but also very instructive on where the world situation is. The headwinds are strong. This world order has changed incredibly. And China is at the lead. All right, everyone, we got 1,300 viewers. Welcome, beautiful people. 616 likes, though. How about we get to 800 to 1,000 likes in the next 20 minutes? Like the stream, it boosts the algorithm. We got another topic coming your way. And a reminder, before I get to it, subscribe to my Patreon, patreon.com slash Danny Highfonder. Support this work annually, monthly, however you can, because I am in an equipment overhaul right now. This channel is growing the demands on it are getting greater. There's a lot of interesting announcements at the end of this program too to get to, but all of them mean that there are more costs associated with doing this work. So please do support if you can. Links are all in the description from Patreon to Substack. You can be a YouTube member uh, and go to link the link tree for one-time options like PayPal and Cash App. All right, so we're going to get to the next topic, okay? And that next topic is... The collective West's efforts to isolate Russia have failed just absolutely miserably. The collective West, I repeat, has failed to isolate Russia. And what do I mean by that? Well, what has been the goal of the Ukraine proxy war from the beginning? It has been to isolate and inevitably commit and conduct regime change on the Russian Federation. Now, if you remember post-Soviet Union, there was something called the Wolfowitz Doctrine by Mr. Paul Wolfowitz, one of the top neocons in the U.S. political and foreign policy establishment. And in that document, what did Paul Wolfowitz say? He said, well, we need to prevent anything like the Soviet Union from forming again, which means we need to make sure that Russia as it stands today, no matter how weak it is, must remain weak, must remain fragmented. And this goes for every single country on the planet that quote unquote threatens the project for a new American century, which would be, uh, uh, which would be launched not more than a half decade or so later. So that was the plan for Russia all along. It wasn't just because Putin came in and started to change things, which he did. He did start to change things. That is 100% true and should not be denied that the economic situation in Russia changed dramatically when Putin came to power in 2000, year 2001, I believe it was, 2000, 2001. And it has failed in this effort, right? So it started, especially during the Obama period, just immensely. Of course, there was the war in Yugoslavia. There was all kinds of uh, meddling from the U.S. in the Eastern European, Baltic states, etc., to get compliant regimes there. Yugoslavia being the bloodiest of the wars the U.S. waged that ended in 1999 with the horrific NATO bombing of Serbia. But there's also the reality that the Ukraine conflict from the beginning has been an attempt to commit regime change on Russia, but isolating it first economically. And this has failed dramatically. It has not just failed in word or deed, right? It is not just a simple matter of, well, the United States and the collective West just didn't get it right. No, actually, it's failed so badly that Russia is actually doing better in some respects 
because of what's going on, it's becoming more secure, more sovereign, and it is creating, right, uh, uh, possibly alternative currencies. It is creating the conditions to be able to be self-reliant. That is very scary when it comes to U.S. hegemony in the collective West. And Russia is doing it, right? And that has been the story. So Russia has thousands of sanctions that have been placed on it by the EU in the United States, really spanning on everything. Everything has been up for grabs in terms of sanctions when it comes to uh, this Ukraine proxy war on Russia. So not only is Russia the most sanctioned country in the world, but it lost $300 billion, I believe it was of U.S. dollar reserves, literally stolen. Assets were literally stolen from Russia. And now European countries that participated in this looting say, we can't find it. That is the situation. But yet Russia, despite, can you imagine thousands of sanctions, all of that money, poof, those that assets gone. And yet Russia's ruble is doing better than it was before the conflict. And Russia is creating a foundation of stability. So Sergei Lavrov actually just chaired the United Nations Security Council, um, and it got a lot of fanfare, okay? And and he, of course, Russia was dragged in the Western media as, as being absolutely unfit for this. And of course, there are always calls to remove Russia from the Security Council by the chicken hawks in Washington and Europe and, and Ukraine, the Ukraine vassals as well. But now Lavrov is speaking at a conference on multipolarity that he made pretty strong remarks over and said very assertively that the West's efforts to isolate Russia has failed. The top diplomat says that nations that comprise of 85% of the world's population are refusing to take part in anti-Russia policy. So what he means is that the sanctions on Russia, while damaging indeed, indeed these sanctions are not good for Russia, but only the collective West is participating in them, meaning that Russia is not alone. Russia has plenty of friends. They're in Africa. They're in Latin America. They're certainly in Asia, with China being its top partner. So Russia is not alone here. And Lavrov is saying, yeah, that's the reality. The West has failed to isolate Russia with the majority of the world still interested in maintaining good relations with Moscow, said Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia. He argued the trend toward multipolarity is irreversible, whether colonial powers, former or existing, like it or not. Addressing the World Online Conference on Multipolarity this weekend, Lavrov said, Washington and its satellites' efforts to reverse history, to force the international community to live by the invented rules-based order, are proving to be a fiasco, citing a total failure by the West to isolate Russia. According to the foreign minister, the number of countries which are combined home of 85% of the world's population have made it clear they will not do the bidding of the former colonial powers. The Russian diplomat said the fact that delegates from several dozen nations from nearly every continent attended the online forum shows just how much traction the idea of multipolarity has gained. Lavrov noted the new global centers are emerging in Eurasia, the Indo-Pacific region, the Middle East, Latin America, and Africa, and that these nations are pursuing independent policies guided by national interests. And yeah, this is 100% true. Now, it's important to note, because I've had some people talk about my show, why aren't you talking about Africa, Latin America? Well, certainly there will be shows where they are certainly put in the forefront. But it, but talking about Russia is talking about these countries because guess what? Russia uh, and Africa, Russia and Latin America are incredibly close partners at this point. You have Russian, you have Russia cooperating with African countries all across northern and western Africa militarily economically. You have the Wagner Group in places like Mali helping with defense and security situations caused by the collective West, caused by NATO's war on Libya, right? This destabilization of the region has been in part responded to by Russia in a way that is stabilizing and has these countries wanting to get even closer. And you remember perhaps during the beginning of the Ukraine conflict, there were images going around in Baghdad of images of Putin. Why do you think that is? Because in Iraq, they know, the people know who is their friend and who is not. 
because the U.S. invaded and destroyed Iraq. And what has Russia done? Increased cooperation. Do is doing business with Iraq in non-dollar denominations in their own respective currencies. The same with Egypt and other countries. De-dollarization is a very key part of all of this, and we're going to get to that in a second. So according to the foreign minister, de um, developing nations have been steadily expanding their share in the global economy over the past three decades, while the role of the G7 has been diminishing. He also held the fact that more and more countries have expressed interest in joining international groups of a new kind, such as BRICS in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Russia, Lavrov explained, champions a multipolar world based on respect for the UN Charter and a balance of interest as opposed to a balance of fear. A balance of interest as opposed to a balance of fear. Meaning that how does the US and the collective West do business with developing countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia? It says, be very afraid because if you don't do what we say, we will sanction you. We will overthrow your governments. We will create opposition groups to destroy your country and destabilize it economically, socially, politically, culturally. We will then invade you and bomb you, drone strike you. We will do everything we can. We will escalate the conflict every way we can. So you have a balance of fear. While Russia operates on the balance of interest, we have something you might want. You have something we want. Will you do business with us? That's how Russia operates on the world stage. And that's how it operated with Ukraine for a very long time. I don't want to hear from naysayers. Oh, well, Russia's just invading Ukraine right now. Well, Russia was a party to the Minsk Accords and upheld its agreement. It upheld its part of that agreement. Guess who didn't? Ukraine and the Western mediating powers, France, Germany, etc. They did not. What did they do? They militarized Ukraine, threatened uh, Russia, while also destroying Lugansk, Donetsk, and the Donbass republics. That's what they did. President Vladimir Putin said on Friday that Moscow will not abide by the so-called rules invented and imposed by certain countries, a.k.a. the U.S. and the collective West. Also on Friday, while addressing members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu claimed that the West is putting unprecedented pressure on independent countries to pit them against Russia and China and undermines the rise of a multipolar world. On Monday, Lavrov called for the expansion of Asian, African, and Latin American representation in the UN Security Council, arguing that the West is overrepresented in the body. So touche. Well, the collective West likes to say, oh, well, actually, Russia it should not be a part of it because look at the human rights violations and look at the Ukraine conflict. Russia is saying, well, we could actually consider the United States as having undue influence, as the collective West having an undue influence, and maybe we should balance it out a bit. Maybe emerging economies, maybe the BRICS countries, maybe the smaller countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, maybe they deserve a run at being in the Security Council and being a more uh, um, assertive part of it, a more influential part of it. Perhaps maybe we need to expand this body so it can actually be relevant rather than just a rubber stamp for U.S. foreign policy diktats, perhaps. So uh, this is very assertive. This has gotten, right, um, even 10 years ago, even during the beginning of the U.S.-Russia row where the U.S. was encircling through NATO, Russia, during the Obama era, there was a lot more conciliatory talk. No more. Russia is not being bullied or anymore. And it's saying we got the global South behind us and uh, we can circumvent your sanctions and your military provocations through friendship. And so it's not just Sergei Lavrov saying that uh, the West's attempts to isolate Russia are failing. No, it's actually the West's own bodies itself. Uh, themselves. They are also admitting this too. So here you have them uh, uh, talking about um, the weakness of Western sanctions, the weakness of Western sanctions on Russia. These sanctions have not worked. I played for you a video not too long ago by G from Janet Yellen on uh, Fareed Zankaria's show. What did she say? Oh, yeah, well, sanctions do potentially undermine the hegemony of the dollar because countries like Russia, Iran, China, they want to do business in their own currencies because they are being isolated from the global economy. Well, that's just a natural response. And she said it so flippantly. Um, but then she said, well, it's a great tool. We can use them very 
judiciously and use them in a smart way. And that will get us the success we want without undermining the dollar. Absolute hogwash, of course, absolute fantasy. But of course, that's the fantasy land that the neocon foreign policy establishment following imperial diktats, that's the land that they live in in their heads. But in reality, even the International Monetary Fund, this Western U.S., really U.S.-led body that has looted and plundered the global south for so long is saying that resilient exports of oil from Russia have bolstered the country's economy, a report from them has found. So the Russian economy has proven to be more resilient to sanctions than anticipated, the International Monetary Fund reported on Friday. According to the IMF, Moscow has managed to redirect its energy exports from sanctioning to non-sanctioning countries. And saw its oil and gas revenues hit record highs last year, driven by soaring energy prices. This helped the Russian economy bounce back strongly in the third and fourth quarters of last year, 2022, limiting the overall drop in output to 2.1%, the IMF wrote in its re latest regional report. The momentum from the second half of last year will carry over into 2023, with growth for the year projected at 0.7%. So you have Russia experiencing positive growth in its key areas, in key areas of its economy, despite massive sanctions from the biggest economies in the world. But what's so interesting is that the global south, of course, is stronger together than it is apart, no matter how underdeveloped one or many of those countries may be. So Russia has said we can unite with all of them even further and more firmly. This isn't new. It happened under the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is very close to the global south. And even after the fall of the Soviet Union, Russia could not just undo all of that, although some of it did unravel because it became internally completely destabilized in some respects, but it didn't undo it completely. And so when Putin came back, instability in Russia began to increase and solidify. Well, these ties were always going to be in the making because it only makes sense. Russia's in the, even though it's not technically quote unquote South geographically, it is a global South country economically, politically, in the sense that it does not belong to the West. It does not belong to the West and never did. It, 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 no matter how much it wanted to be a party of the West after the fall of the Soviet Union, never belonged to the West. And so now you have the IMF reporting that sanctions have failed because Russia has a lot of energy. This is very simple. Russia has a lot of energy. Countries all around the world, especially developing countries, what do they need to form industries? What do they need to run and charge their economy? They need energy. They need oil. Not all countries produce oil. Guess which country is most in need of oil? It's China. That's why China is so close to Saudi Arabia. That's why China has built such strong relations with Russia in this new era that they call it. These comprehensive strategic partnerships with these energy producers, Iran, another one. It's because they want a diverse portfolio of energy producers to help them, to help China run its industrial what they call socialist market economy. It's uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. They need that energy to power that economy, whatever you want to call it, right? It's a huge one. It's the biggest in the world by purchasing power parity terms, and it by far dominates in most industrial categories at this point. So natural gas and crude oil prices hit record highs last summer in world markets following sanctions-related restrictions on supplies from Russia, a leading energy exporter. This year, however, the prices dropped to levels seen before February 2022, following a mild winter and a price cap on Russian oil. According to the IMF, it is still too early to assess the impact of sanctions, but the price cap on crude has not led to a decline in Russian oil volume so far. So there you have it. So the oil price cap is a failure. I mean, it's a disaster. Because while crude prices have not skyrocketed as much as they thought, you know, if, if you're a, a thinking person, you know what's happening economically all across the collective West. Reports from Germany, there's so much optimism when inflation goes down 0.2% to be 7.1% increase year on year, right? That's optimism for Europe. That's really bad. It's really bad for average prices. And you know, it's higher than the average price, 7.1%. It's under estimates. But it's really bad when European countries, especially the major powerhouses like Germany, are celebrating 0.2% decreases in inflation when they've already increased 7, 8, 9% percent 
year on year in the consumer price index. It's not good. It's a really bad situation. And the sanctions have caused that by raising the price of oil, thereby cascading into every, everything that oil is needed to produce. It is a cascade effect in capital, big capital. They're saying, well, we can even profit more from this. So we're going to go even beyond the uh, general inflation numbers. And yeah, you can go buy $12 eggs. You can go buy, um, you know, uh, your homes are going to cost 100,000, 200,000 more dollars or euros than they would before. Yeah, we're going to do all of this because guess what? The United States, the EU, their sanctions have provided fertile ground for economic instability. And that is what's happening. And it's not hurting Russia as much as it's hurting the U.S., in NATO countries, the EU, et cetera. Never, nevertheless, lower prices will lead to a sharp decline in Russia's fiscal revenues this year, the report predicts. The IMF forecasts Russia's output in 2027 to be around 8% lower than predicted before the start of the military operation in Ukraine. According to estimates released by the Bank of Russia on Friday, the economy will grow by 2% this year, supported by growing domestic demand in the country adapting to sanctions. That's higher than Germany. That's higher than the UK. And it's probably going to be higher than the U.S., although I never believe the U.S.'s number in terms of GDP. I, I truly believe the U.S. has been zero growth for quite some time. And all this 2%, 3% year on year is all just a uh, window dressing, right, in an increasingly financialized economy. So uh, the collective West is in real big trouble, real big trouble. And Russia has been able to curb the storm. And so that's incredibly important because there's there's more to this, all right? It's not just that they've beat back sanctions. We have to understand the how. And so a big part of the how is, of course, trading in your most uh, resource-rich commodity in places where they'll actually take it. So China, right? At the African continent, West Asia, uh, the Middle East, uh, Latin America, right? Uh, increasing oil expenditures, right? It's happened with Cuba and Russia. It's happened with China and Russia. Uh, oil trade, natural gas trade has boomed in these countries, and Russia has been a big part of that. But it also has to do with de-dollarization. We talk about that a lot in this program, de-dollarization. So the dollars were taken from Russia. They took them. The assets, Russia's dollar reserves and, and the assets associated were stolen and plundered by the U.S., and its European countries that were holding the reserves in their uh, banks, essentially. And CGTN wrote this. And so when you see Chinese media talking about de-dollarization in this way, you best believe it is a really uh, a real phenomenon, right? Because Chinese media does not talk about anything that it doesn't take seriously. If you know anything about Chinese media, whatever you think about it, and uh, uh, of course you can uh, think what you will, that's your right. But Chinese media tends to only talk about things that are happening, actually happening. And it only talks about things that are serious. It doesn't get into allegedly. It doesn't get into maybe. It doesn't get into, oh, what's going to happen? No, it mostly talks about what is happening. And de-dollarization is the trend here. So de-dollarization has been very important for Russia. And Russia is in many ways the leader in this. I would say China is also a leader in this, if not just as much of a leader, because the yuan tends to be the currency that a lot of these global South countries, including Russia, wants to uh, leverage for de-dollarization uh, efforts and mechanisms. But Russia has been spearheading it in many ways the most because it's existential for Russia. Russia needs to do this and it needs to do it fast. That's why you have people like uh, Mr. Glazyev and others close to Russia's economic team trying to figure out how to do this, how to figure out how to do this soon. And it has led to all kinds of really interesting developments. So de-dollarization, a growing trend as an anti-greenback drive intensifies. So de-dollarization has become a buzzword in recent weeks as economists, international media outlets, and business leaders have taken note of the slump of the greenback in its share of trade and foreign reserves, a development that's particularly marked at a time when Washington's weaponization of the currency has alienated many of its users. Many agree the trend of de-dollarization has taken hold because the U.S. sanctions regime, especially the deluge of sanctions it opposed on Russia since the Ukraine conflict, has driven the countries affected to push for alternatives to the dollar. 
Meanwhile, a growing number of countries, including U.S. allies, have been calling for a check on dollar hegemony. Every night I ask myself, said Brazilian President Lula da Silva in his impassioned speech during his trip to China earlier this month, he asks himself why all countries have to base their trade on the dollar. Why can't we do trade on our own currencies, he added. Who was it that decided the dollar was the currency after the disappearance of the gold standard? So it was really the Nixon administration. <laughs> so, I mean, Bretton Woods created the foundation for this right after World War II. The Bretton Woods Conference was a meeting with the U.S. and all of these European leaders. And Europe was in tatters. And the U.S. said, hey, we can be the ones to bail you out. But it means that the dollar has to take prime significance. It has to become the foreign reserve currency of the world, the primary foreign reserve currency of the world. Will you do it? European country said, yes, we'll be your junior partner. We will be your vassal. Um, this should help us because, you know, World War II ruined us. And thanks for watching that for so long. We really appreciate it. Um, I, I, of course, I'm being sarcastic there. But um, and then, of course, in the early 1970s, the gold standard was dropped. And uh, the dollar became really a fiat currency, completely financialized, and um, dollar domination only intensified because in a lot of ways, the U.S. became even more hegemonic, even as its economy began to sputter. And that's a really interesting contradiction that not many people talk about, is that I, around the 1970s, U.S. industrial output, its share of the economy, actually started to descend. It's one of the reasons why the U.S. was so desperate to normalize with China because China is a huge economy. It didn't want it in the Soviet sphere, and it needed Chinese low-wage labor to help repower a flailing industrial economy because of Vietnam. There was a lot of contradictions, the oil crisis, uh, you name it, that was on the way. And so with that short history lesson, let's get back into this. <laughs> I do digress. Um, reflecting concerns shared by countries from Southeast Asia to Europe, Lula's comments were followed by President French President Emmanuel Macron's sweeping rebuff to Europe's dependence on the U.S. dollar. The extraterritoriality of the U.S. dollar needs to be resisted, Macron said when he made a visit to China. The growing calls for de-dollarization have come against the backdrop of a markedly sharp decline in the dollar's market share. De-dollarization is real and is happening, says economist Peter St. Onge in a video post on Twitter. Dollar share went from 73% in 2001 to 55% in 2020. Went from 55% in 20 to 47% since the sanctions were launched on Russia. And now de-dollarization is happening 10 times faster than the previous two decades. The dollar suffered a stunning collapse in 2022 in its market share as a reserve currency, presumably due to its muscular use of sanctions, said Stephen Jen, CEO of Euro of Eurizon SJ SLJ Capital LTD, and his colleague Joanna Ferrer wrote in a note. Exceptional actions taken by the U.S. and its allies against Russia have startled large foreign, large reserve holding countries. You know which is the biggest of these? Saudi Arabia, the petrodollar. Saudi Arabia relies on the dollar a lot for its energy trade and investment. Um, and Saudi Arabia is saying, hey, China, why don't we trade oil in your currency? Hey, Russia, how about we get closer so that we can circumvent these sanctions and help uh, create a cost environment that uh, the cost of oil environment that is beneficial to all of us, meaning higher prices, because that's what Saudi Arabia wants. That's what Russia wants. That's why Biden and U.S. administrations for decades now have been going to Saudi Arabia saying lower the oil prices when we tell you to. And why is that? Because it helps the U.S. and it helps the dollar. It helps stabilize it. But now Saudi Arabia is singing a different tune getting closer to China, the China Arab Summit earlier last year. And then you, of course, have the remarkable brokering of peace between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and now the end of the Yemen war. And you have all of these developments happening as China and Saudi Arabia's cooperation intensifies and elevates to the point that really spells the doom of U.S. hegemony in the Middle East, but not just the Middle East, and everywhere. So with the dollar's dominance, while the dollar's dominance won't be challenged in the short term, developing countries' ability to diverse from the currency is not preordained, and there's a possible future where countries other than the dollar, other than the U.S., will actively shun from using the dollar, Jen Set and Ferrari wrote. So you have these economists, you have world leaders, you have people all around the world, right, uh, experts talking about de-dollarization in a very real way. 
And this has only helped Russia because there's many elements to that. There's many elements to why that helps Russia. For one, de-dollarization just as a concept, politically, having it become on the order of the day, having it be thrust into the political situation worldwide, having it be more of interest from countries all around the world, means that sanctioned Russia can operate even more easily on the world stage. That's why Lavrov said, hey, look, 85% of countries actually like us and want to trade with us. Well, a lot of that a lot of that has to do with currency. If you're not talking currency with trade, then you're not really talking about trade. And so uh, that's what Sergey Lavrov is really referring to. And that's why de-dollarization is so important. And then, of course, there's the nuts and bolts. Yes, Russia is looking to trade and it actually is doing so with countries like America and Asia, especially China, is doing so in its own currency. You have Russia and uh, India, for example, trading in rupees, the Indian currency. So this is happening, and it's happening pretty rapidly. And soon, the BRICS summit, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and the 19-plus countries that want to join BRICS eventually, there will be discussion on that in August in Cape Town, South Africa, meaning that this discussion of expanding BRICS is also going to include how do we get this new development bank, BRICS development bank, up to speed, and how do we begin to facilitate the process of de-dollarization in very concrete terms, not just bypassing the dollar and bilateral ties, but how do we make a multilateral mechanism out of BRICS, an institutional mechanism that will create an independent currency? Will it be the yuan pegged to the commodities of these resource-rich countries? Will it be a new currency altogether that takes into account the purchasing power parity of all of these currencies pegged to their respective commodities. It will be very interesting to see what happens, but it is going to happen eventually. And it'll be very interesting to note whether it happens or begins to happen during this conference. We know that Russia is very keen on getting this ready as soon as possible. Okay. That is the reality of the situation. De-dollarization is a big reason why the U.S. and the collective West, its vassals in the collective West, its NATO vassals, cannot really isolate Russia economically is because there are more countries willing to talk about de-dollarization. Even Europe, even France, a lot of the, you know, these countries are going to have to go this way as well because the economic situation is only going to be more turbulent as the dollar is weaponized further and further to undermine the sovereignty and integrity of countries in the global south. We live in an era where the U.S. and the collective wealth cannot be self-reliant. They have globalized the world. They are the agents of globalization. And there are some benefits to that worldwide. And there's a lot of drawbacks when it comes to the U.S. and the West's leadership over it, meaning that it is a globalization of imperialism. It's a globalization of hegemony. It's a globalization of usurpation, of plunder, of looting, of neocolonialism. That's what globalization is as of right now. That's why you're China and Russia. When they talk about globalization, they're talking about something completely different. They're talking about a multilateral, multipolar world order where countries work together mutually, cooperatively to meet each other's interests and where sovereignty is very much a part of that equation, if not the most important part. So this effort to bring about de-dollarization is all part of this larger political trend that Russia is in large part spearheading and benefiting from already. And so this world is different than what you hear in CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, wherever you're listening to your corporate media, New York Times, they are speaking from the lens of the neocons, from the lens in the brains of these foreign policy so-called experts who believe that the only route forward in the world is U.S. domination. Well, the world is actually already has changed, and U.S. domination is becoming a thing of the past, and Russia bypassing these sanctions – uh, being able to uh, withstand this NATO encirclement and now this proxy war in Ukraine 
is an incredible indicator that this world order cannot be shaken by U.S. imperial diktats anymore. And the rise of China and, of course, these multilateral and multipolar initiatives that both of these countries lead is only going to benefit further the smaller countries of the world who matter just as much. The African nations like Ethiopia and Eritrea and Zimbabwe to the south and South Africa from, uh, you know, bigger countries like India, uh, uh, you know, we can go on and on and on, right, about all the countries that stand to benefit, Venezuela, Cuba, all these countries, Syria, right, Iran, all of these countries stand to benefit from all of this, and they're benefiting right now. That's why you have Argentina, Brazil, talking about de-dollarization, joining uh, Argentina, joining BRICS. You have Turkey, right, getting incredibly close to both Russia and China. Saudi Arabia, foregone conclusion at this point about where Saudi Arabia stands, and it stands pretty firmly in the we're going to ensure that Russia and China are strong partners for the years and decades to come, so long as Saudi Arabia exists as a, as a regime, right? Um, so, you know, this is a different world that we live in. The world has changed, and Russia has shown by fighting off sanctions, being able to uh, preserve itself, preserve its sovereignty, and move forward, move forward, progress. That is incredibly inspirational to the rest of the world, whether it be African countries who are holding up the Russian flag, the Wagner flag all across North, West and Eastern Africa, especially Northeastern Africa, or whether it is the fact that African countries, whether it's Ghana, whether it's Namibia, these countries saying we're not obsessed with this anti-China rhetoric, United States, right to the United States' face. We're actually pretty happy with our relationship with China. Or whether it's Venezuela uh, coming out strongly recently, Nicolas Maduro coming out strongly in favor of China, Brazil uh, going to Beijing, having an incredibly fruitful meeting, Cuba increasing cooperation with both of them, right? Whether it's all, all these developments spell the doom and end of U.S. hegemony and Russia's successful fight back is one of the biggest parts of that. All right, everyone, that was a whirlwind second topic. We have 1,300 viewers. Welcome, beautiful viewers, 985 likes. Let's get to over 1,000. Thanks so much for liking this stream. It really helps boost the stream and the algorithm, so keep hitting it if you have not yet. Also, of course, I'm continuing to plug the fact that I am on an equipment overhaul. Um, I am really working to make upgrades, um, uh, a lot of upgrades, both mobily as well as um i'm also making to my home studio here i'm trying i need a new computer device so every little bit helps thank you all for the super chats thank you Raphael, who did subscribe i would like to thank you are watching this stream and that's why you subscribe so if you if that's the case thank you so much um and thanks to everyone who's going to donate if you do from uh, paypal i see someone on paypal irene thanks so much and I'll get to the super chats at the end, of course, and shout out all you beautiful people. Um, so thank you all to the super chatters. Of course, one-time options, as you can see from what I'm saying. Substack is a great option annually as well. All of that is in the links in the description. And of course, go to Linktree if you want to find all of them in one place. But with all of that said, we have one more topic before we chill and have some fun here. Um, <laughs> uh, I hope this has been fun for you so far. But we're going to have even more fun at the end because it'll be really chill. And um, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, this is Saturday night. My wife's out of town. I uh, thought I would spend the evening with all of you as I'm, uh, you know, as I, uh, 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 you know, continue moving on with this show. It's progressing. It's going really well. I'm so incredibly happy to have built this community. So thanks all of you who are viewing. This has been great. Uh, it's been uh, not something I expected to come out of my YouTube work, really. I didn't think I would be here, but here I am. So thanks so much. All right, everybody. Um, let's see. <laughs> uh, last topic, and this one's going to be fun for me because, as you all know, I focus a lot on China on this channel. I also have an affinity toward the Asia-Pacific region, not least because I am part Vietnamese. Uh, but also because I do believe Asia is the future. I also believe that there's a lot of uh, ideological reasons for my affinity 
especially because China's system has been something that's interested me for quite many years now. And um, thank you so much for the new member. I, I see you, <laughs> Farty Life. Farty Life, thanks so much. Uh, party Life, I said Farty Life. Right, that's how you know it's a little late for me. That's how you know it's a little late. Party Life, thanks so much. Um, let's get to the topic though, okay? So between the days of April, I believe it was 21st, to the 29th. So we're taught 24th to the 29th. April 24th to the 29th, you had um oh actually let me pull something up before I get because I need to play this cringe um cringe segment. All right. So before I get to the topic, stick around. Hold on one second. All right. I need to get to this cringe segment. Um let me see. Oh, okay. Oh, here we go. Here we go. I'll, I'll pull up the Al Jazeera. So we're going to get to this cringe segment, but I want to just give you a layout of what was going on. So from the 24th to the 29th of April, today was the last day, it's the 29th, South Korea's president, uh, Yoon suk Yeol, very conservative, very conservative president, very pro-U.S. Yoon suk Yeol, president of South Korea, went to Washington on the invitation of the Biden administration, only the second such invitation from the Biden administration. As you can see, Biden doesn't do much diplomacy or any, because I don't count this as diplomacy. So the president of South Korea went for a five-day visit, and it was, of course, much hyped, and a lot of damaging things came out of this. A lot of cringe moments came out of this. But I want to give you a background of why this was happening in the first place. And so this visit from the 24th to 29th of April, this visit was happening, I wrote in CGTN. I am an opinions contributor there. Yoon say visit to the U.S. is about hegemony and damage control, not diplomacy. So I talk about this visit as damage control, not diplomacy. Hegemony and not diplomacy. Because the invitation was not about building better bilateral relations on an equal basis. It was about telling South Korea to get your behind to D.C. We have the DPRK, North Korea and China to get to. We need you to be a good puppet state with your thousands of U.S. troops stationed, you know, dozens of bases stationed. We need you to be what you're supposed to be, our puppet. And so it's time to amp up the economic and military aggression. That was the point. So they called it trust and deterrence, but trust and deterrence simply means those things that I just stated. So Yoon visited, and so a day before his trip, you had the Financial Times reporting that the U.S. was urging South Korea not to fill any market gap in China if Beijing bans a Washington mem Washington's memory chip maker from selling chips. That is obviously an act that impairs South Korea's economic sovereignty, intervenes in the internal affairs of South Korea, and violates trade rules and demonstrates the U.S.'s hegemony. So get what that means. That means that before the trip, the U.S. was already making demands. It already said, we're going to increase our, we've already had this export ban on China's, uh, on semiconductor technology to China. China is ready to retaliate by uh, banning some of our equipment, right? Making it harder for that equipment to reach the Chinese market. You're not to fill that gap for China. Do what we say, okay? Do what we say. Yoon's trip, and that's, I mean, that's incredibly damaging because I'm going to get to why in a second. It's hurt South Korea's economy already, this export ban. Yoon's trip is coming amid an unstable period for U.S.-South Korea relations as shown by the following two facts. On the one hand, Yoon's conservative government has placed a priority on developing warm relations with the U.S., its bolstered military ties, and its ongoing row with the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. From the 13th of March to the March 23rd, the U.S. and South Korea held their largest joint military drills in five years. Yoon has placed the issue high on the agenda, that of DPRK, for this summit and was going to bring a delegation of hundreds of 100 business delegates in a signal that South Korea is willing to strengthen its economic cooperation with the United States. You think, you know, a lot of people in the U.S. and the West might think, oh, well, that's reasonable. The DPRK is a big threat, right? It's a big threat as well as, oh, well, South Korea should do business with the United States. Well, it's more complicated than that because that's only the one side of it, right? If you, I mean, first of all, 
if you want to look at the history of the Korean War, it was the U.S. as the aggressor propping up the South to be uh, the genocidaire uh, puppet of the United States. That's what actually happened through the DMZ that was drawn, right, in the Soviet Union, the U.S. going through some kind of Cold War. But really, it was the U.S. that invaded and destroyed and killed many people, destroyed the entire uh, entirety of, of North Korea's infrastructure. That's what really happened. And so you have these escalations with military exercises and this economic cooperation is not really cooperation at all. And we can see that from the fact that the bilateral relationship is not equal. South Korea is a subordinate. Yoon has taken controversial stances on the leaked Pentagon documents that revealed the U.S. has spied on South Korean official as they mull over the prospects of sending weapons to Ukraine. That just happened. Those leaks came out not too long ago. That's only been a matter of weeks, right? That came out this month, this month of April, 2023. These leaked Pentagon documents. What did they say? They said that the U.S. had knowledge of South Korea's conversations about sending Ukraine weaponry. And remember, I covered on this channel, the New York Times report on this issue, where they knew and understood that the U.S. was going to ask South Korea to 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 give up some of its stockpiles for the war effort in Ukraine and go and and bypass um, bypass uh, the, sending it to the Ukraine directly by giving it to a third country. So the Yoon government has maintained that much of the documents were fabricated and that the U.S. had no malicious intent in its intelligence gathering. This position has been characterized as humiliating diplomacy by opposition parties in South Korea and has exacerbated unrest over other issues such as the lack of accountability on Japanese firms that participated in forced labor within the country during World War II, as well as the growing public discontent with the nation's ailing economy. So just FYI, it's been a huge point of controversy for many years now, right? Since the end of, the, uh, of World War II. Japan colonized Korea. And what did Japan do? Well, it basically enslaved people. It enslaved people to work for Japanese com companies to help with Japan's industrialization. That's a very common theme with colonization. And it happened. And after the fall of Japan's empire, after the end of World War II, there has been years and years of conversation about what it would mean for there to be uh, uh, some kind of settlement, some kind of process of justice to get people the money, uh, the ancestors of these uh, enslaved people, uh, to get them some kind of monetary compensation and otherwise. What has Yoon done in this conversation? He's actually bypassed Japan's government and said, no, we'll only deal with the companies. And the companies, of course, are not going to give a lot, right? And they're not going to have much uh, incentive to give a lot. And that's angered a lot of people in South Korea who say, you're not serious about this. But it only got worse during the meeting. Because during the meeting, uh, uh, during the meeting in the U.S., South Korea at the same time reestablished preferred trading status with Japan, further pouring oil onto the fire, gasoline onto the fire. So people in South Korea are furious because now uh, preferred trading status has been reestablished with Japan. And all Yoon can say is, well, our economic interests with Japan are way more, and, and our partnership and friendship with Japan are way more important than those concerns of you little people who are probably still poor because you had to start off with facing uh, Japanese colonialism decades ago, and we're not going to help you get justice from Japan. That's 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 what is happening. And then you have the economic situation, right? This is the context you need to understand to understand what's going on. The economic situation is is very very bad in South Korea. So there's a huge trade deficit, which has been caused by the U.S.'s export bans on semiconductor technology to China. China comprised of nearly 40% of South Korea's chip exports prior to the ban's enforcement last year. But since the export ban, South Korea has seen its exports have as of January of last year, and it's only gotten worse. This has exacerbated macroeconomic pressure from inflation, and some experts predict 
South Korea is headed toward an economic crisis because the U.S., of course, is weaponizing the dollar and placing downward pressure on all currencies, the, the euro, but also the South Korean won. So Yoon's visit is yet another exercise in the U.S.'s ongoing effort to contain China and expand its hegemony in the region at the expense of so-called allies. The U.S. wants to strengthen its military relationship with nations like South Korea and Japan while seeking assurances from these governments that they will loyally follow the United States in destructive escalations toward China. Yoon's visit is also an exercise in damage control meant to show that there are benefits to doing uh, to being a partner of the United States, that being a vassal of the United States can ex- actually bring you um, bring you benefits. But one of the biggest mistakes that Yoon made on this trip in preparation for it was commenting on the Taiwan issue. And so the Taiwan issue, of course, is China's red line. And South Korea's President Yoon said, well, Taiwan's a global issue and it's just comparable to the DPRK and South Korea's conflict, this anger China. There was a call recall of the uh, ambassadors, right? Um, the Chinese ambassadors in Korea, and there has been a souring of relations ever since, and there's been no, um, there's no reconsideration of this remark. So that's a huge thing. So this, this was all a lead up. South Korea was fluffing the pillow, so to speak, for the United States saying, yeah, we're going to bring to you a host of things that will make you happy so you can make us happy. Well, it only got more cringe, right? And, and it only gets more, and, and it's ridiculous because the United, uh, South Korea needs Chinese investment. It, Chinese investment is huge for South Korea, 44.5% right there. With chi- in, 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 in 2022 alone, investment increased by 44% between the two countries. But now that's all, that's all been... That's all been put under danger. And this visit only made things worse, right? It's all about this effort to try to isolate and contain China, while, of course, throwing in the DPRK for good measure because the U.S. is still at war with Korea and it wants to use South Korea as a pawn to continue it. So all of that was on the table during this visit. But before we get into the nuts and bolts of what came out of it, because it was bad, right? What came out of it is dangerous. What came out of it is incredibly... um, um, damaging. But before we get to that, we have to look at the cringe, just absolute undignified way that President Yoon went about his visit. And I got to show you, this is Yoon suk This is Al Jazeera reporting on this absolutely humiliating scene of him singing American Pie to Joe Biden. There is nothing more, I think, heinous than this act of this display of this minstrel show that Yoon suk Yeol put on for Biden, all in the name of warmongering and at the expense of South Korea's own interests. So let's listen to this because... It, it's at, you, you need to see this to understand the dynamics here. This is not a bilateral relationship. This is a relationship of colonizer and colonized, neo-colonizer and neo-colony. This is vassal to master. Here we go. Long, long time ago. <laughs> Look at Biden's face. Is he there? Is Biden home? I mean, can can someone help this guy? It, look at that stare. It. This is absolute. This is a joke, right? This is absolutely a joke. Here we go. Let's continue. Whoa, 
that's so cool. Wow, the Asian guy, right? He can sing like an American. Oh, wow. All the while, all the while, what was he doing there? He was selling out South Korea on behalf of the United States is uh, absolutely counterproductive war on China that they are escalating, and as well as this war, of course, on, on Korea. <laughs> Korea is at war, and South Korea is a party to it. So all that is to say is that Yoon was being used as a puppet, and he was willfully, willfully ready to be that puppet. So I want to show you, this is what the Global Times had to say about it, okay? Um, and they'll go over, the Global Times does a good job briefly. And I was going to do the readout of the White House, but it's way too long because they're trying to be so overly detailed to show the world that U.S.-South Korea relations are so strong, right? They use semiconductor like 50 times because this is really about tanking. South Korea's semiconductor industry by uh, attaching it to the United States at the expense of China. It's only backfiring, of course, because China is becoming more independent with the semiconductor industry, while South Korea is watching its trade deficit balloon and watching as the U.S. offers nothing in return for its vassal ship. But nonetheless, um, uh, you know, it, it, here are the devil in the details. Here's the devil in the details about what happened. And it's important to note because a lot of escalations militarily actually occurred. And here it is. So the Global Times is also just an entertaining read because they don't pull no punches when it comes to this kind of puppeteering. It seems that South Korean President Yoon suk yeol views or identifies the Washington Declaration as the biggest achievement of his visit to the U.S. He described it with passionate language as an unprecedented commitment by the United States. So this is what was agreed to this Washington Declaration at the meeting. The Washington Declaration issued after Yoon's talk with President Joe Biden has two main contents, the establishment of a new nuclear consultative group, the NCG, and the upcoming visit of a U.S. nuclear ballistic missile submarine to South Korea for the first time in more than 40 years. It is said to strengthen extended deterrence against North Korea. So there you go. Huge escalation, right? This is a huge escalation in the nuclear direction. In other words, Yoon wants to bring back a nuclear umbrella from the U.S. However, compared with various gifts he brought to the U.S. and the cost of South Korea's interest in this visit, this so-called nuclear umbrella appears to be unrealistic and only bring new risks. It is not only is not it is not it is not only not an achievement report to the domestic public in South Korea, but is highly likely to ignite a new round of tension on the Korean Peninsula. Its hidden side targeting China is also a potential hazard for South Korea. In the face of Yoon's return from the U.S., clear-minded South Koreans will be concerned and cannot possibly be delighted. So, yeah, I mean, do you think China is happy that a nuclear submarine is now parked right on its shores? Because South Korea, of course, and China are, are very close geographically. Do you think China is happy or the DPRK is happy that there is even more of a commitment now from the United States and South Korea to escalate with the DPRK? No. What will it do? Will it help matters? Will it help peace? Will it help stability? No. It's only going to escalate things. And guess what? None of this has anything to do with the needs of, well, uh, the South Korean people. The, the people in South Korea, they, they have kind of needs right now. Things are not looking too good internally. The, I, I covered right back uh, um, last year, I covered the protests that were happening there. There's union uh, mass protest strikes happening there because of the economic situation is bad and they connect it to this intensified militarization of South Korea. They do. So some U.S. media have described the declaration as a fig leaf used for concealing embarrassment for the, <laughs> you get that, used for concealing embarrassment in uh, parentheses here um, because that's what it was. It was an embarrassment. For the U.S. to dissuade South Korea from going nuclear, but its negative impact on South Korea is obviously more than that. It is full of irony to call it a diplomatic achievement or a victory for Yoon's government. Rather than saying that it has received an unprecedented commitment to nuclear protection, it is clear it has lost autonomy unprecedentedly. The real winner is Washington. It has almost no cost, only the declaration that is of little practical use. It exchanged the substance of the U.S. with South Korea's face. 
The UN administration wanted nuclear sharing, but the U.S. did not loosen its stance and South Korea had to say no to nuclear decision making. To elevate the irregular nuclear dialogue mechanism to a regular one and to send Ohio-class nuclear submarines deployed to Guam to South, in Guam to South Korea on a regular basis, it is more of a psychological comfort to South Korea, but for Northeast Asia, it is like inviting a wolf into the house. So context here. South Korea still does not have full control over its military, so not many people know this. So while it has um, in armistice times, right, in times where, let's say, the DPRK, hold on one second, in times where the DPRK in, in South Korea aren't in open conflict like right now, South Korea has control over its military. But should there be any declaration of rearming, right, this conflict, a direct confrontation militarily between these two countries, uh, um, there will be the ability of Washington to, to seize control of South Korea's military. That is, um, you know, that's only been, that's only like two and a half decades long, right? That that's been the case. Before that, the U.S. just had full control, full control over South Korea's military. It didn't matter. Um, there was no like, ooh, well, in these cases or in that case. No, it was fully under U.S. control. Now it is just partially under control, but in really important ways. And that's what Global Times is talking about here. It's by getting close to the U.S. in this way, you're actually only sacrificing more of South Korea's autonomy. So the root cause of a longstanding nuclear issue on the peninsula lies with the U.S. If South Korea really wants a sense of security, it needs to urge the U.S. to adopt a more responsible attitude toward formulating policy toward North Korea and to work with all parties to promote denuclearization on the peninsula. Bringing U.S. nuclear power into the peninsula would inevitably create strong stimuli for North Korea and to further exacerbate the security dilemma on the Korean peninsula. The security presence on the peninsula is indivisible, and joint security is the inevitable choice for achieving lasting peace. South Korea is really on the wrong path. In this regard, the lessons learned from the conflict between Russia and Ukraine are profound. So look at that. Global Times is saying, hey, South Korea, do you really want to be Ukraine? Do you really want war to be sparked? You're not going to do well in that situation. You're not, right? The DPRK is going to continue to militarize and to defend itself if it feels provoked from South Korea. And this move, right, getting nuclear submarines uh, uh, from the United States and giving the U.S. even more control over South Korea militarily is only going to exacerbate that problem for South Korea itself. But then you factor in the equation China. China is very unhappy by a military encirclement. I'm going to show you a graphic on exactly why that might be. And all of this is to say is that South Korea is not in a good position here. So China is saying, learn from Ukraine. Ukraine isn't doing too hot. You're not going to be doing too hot either very soon. Yoon's visit to the U.S. is already more than, uh, so this was a little old, a couple days old. So it's already happened. The visit has ended. But it's obvious that South Korea did not get the autonomy it expected. Instead, the U.S. has gained even deeper control over the country. It is more clearly reflecting the leaders' joint statement in the commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the alliance between the U.S. and the Republic of Korea issued the same day as the Washington Declaration. The statement's position on regional and major international issues is completely in line with Washington's tone in terms of content and language. Although it is called a joint statement, South Korea is merely a signatory. The joint statement ambiguously talks of the so-called economic coercion and once again mentioned peace and stability in the Taiwan Straits. Being a signatory to such a statement is bound to harm mutual trust with China. So there you have it. South Korea again pulled the China card and decided it was going to go with South with uh, the U.S. on this issue again, right? By not affirming the one China principle, China has raised eyebrows right now. China China knows that South Korea has been playing a dangerous game for many years, especially since the encirclement of China began circa around the Obama era or really intensified. But now it has become even more problematic. And China is well aware of this. At the joint press conference after the meeting between Joe Biden and Yoon, the U.S. side talked almost exclusively about how these achievements would, quote unquote, achievements would promote U.S. interests and journalists were more concerned about domestic U.S. affairs. Some netizens in China described the interests of South Korea as equivalent to air at this press conference. This undoubtedly made Yoon mention of a, Yoon's mention of a truly global alliance at the press conference even more awkward, meaning President Yoon, it, it was like South Korean president wasn't even there. That's what this meeting was. It was just come over here, do what we say, get out. That's how the U.S. treats its so-called allies. 
And South Korea is no different. Sing us American Pie, good, le- good little puppet. Sing us American Pie, will you? Recently, there have been media reports in the White House that Washington requested Seoul to push pressure put pressure on South Korean chip manufacturers to increase to not increase chip sales to China when China investigates the US company Micron Technology to prevent Korean companies from taking advantage of the market gap left by US companies. This is a true reflection of the US South Korean relationship. Previously South Korea had been talking about diplomatic relations with four major powers, but now it's become completely one-sided toward the US and is inevitable for it to lose balance and even lose itself. The American Newsweek publication has an article uh, that was published during Yoon's visit to the U.S., suggesting that it's time for an East Asian NATO, advocating for a so-called economic NATO based on democratic values with the U.S., Japan, South Korea, and China's Taiwan region, which is a malicious and sly proposal made by someone who sees that the U.S. controls South Korea. South Korea's strengthening dependence on the U.S. is the vulnerability that the U.S. has seized. Some have said that all the governments of South Korea's history, Yoon administration, may be the most least independent-minded toward the U.S., and this visit to the U.S. undoubtedly confirms this evaluation. So this was the prize for the United States, right? This is exactly what the United States wanted. And and so the Global Times is always very, uh, I would say, um, entertaining in this regard because (laughs) what it outlined there was in very, uh, I, I would say, sharp terms, right? very sharp terms that the dp that 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 south korea is nothing but a pawn of the us and this is what the biden administration always wanted from the beginning of its first term that's quickly coming to an end um the elections are happening very soon there's already preparations for biden's reelection effort but his goal from the beginning with china with the dprk with so-called adversaries in the region, but China being the biggest prize, was to create so-called multilateral institutions, multilateral being really just a catchphrase here for uh, making uh, so-called quote-unquote alliances on its own terms that would follow its diktats. So, So essentially that was the goal, right? The Quad, AUKUS, all of these military alliances that the Biden administration has either spearheaded or strengthened have all been about isolating and containing China through multilateralism. But not multilateralism as Russia and China see it, as most countries in the world would like to see it through the UN Charter and how it's outlined there, mutual cooperation, etc. No, that's not mutual cooperation. This is U.S. domination. It is the United States telling weaker countries, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, etc. You need to follow us or else. You need to follow us or else. And we're going to call China the boogeyman. And you're going to have to decouple from China, get closer to us. And what will we offer you? We'll offer you more war. Here's a nuclear submarine, South Korea. Give us more control over your political situation, your military situation, so that we can provoke with the DPRK, we can provoke with China, and we can continue this encirclement campaign that has been the goal all along. And guess what? Follow us on Taiwan. That South Korea did this is the ultimate betrayal, right? To betray the entire region, all of the Asia Pacific, by going on with the U.S. on the Taiwan question is inexcusable. And I don't believe this administration is going to make it very far. I just don't. I think this administration uh, in South Korea is not going to make it very far because it comes on the heels, right? It comes on the heels of a massive, a massive crisis of legitimacy. This president in South Korea had his government spied on by the U.S. Not only did he have his government spied on by the United States, but he has not been willing to commit to the the people of South Korea any kind of legitimate compensation to the victims of Japanese aggression. Not only this, but he has been willing before even getting anything in return from the United States to suicidally uh, 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 tank his own economy, South Korea's own economy, by promising not to trade with China where any gaps may arise in China's investigation of Micron technology, uh, of this 
uh, uh, chip make of this chip industry industrial company of the United States. So South Korea has basically said to the United States, we will kiss your feet. This is what Yoon has done. He said, I will kiss your feet. I will sing you American pie and I'll do whatever you want, even if it means increased escalation in the region, even if it means the threat of nuclear conflict, whether it's the DPRK or China, and even if it means that South Korea will be sacrificed, its national interests will be sacrificed. It doesn't matter because President Yoon is ready to play puppet. His visit with the United States was all about playing puppet. And now the consequences are going to start to bear fruit. And it will be very, very sour for South Korea. And you better believe that China and the DPRK are ready to respond. The DPRK, with this latest military escalation, will respond militarily. China, both with the military escalation and the economic front, it will continue to do what it has done from the beginning of this encircle commit, encirclement campaign, push forward with multipolarity and increase its own self-reliance. It will increase its own self-reliance and it will build strong relations where strong relations are wanted. And it will be okay. Not only will it be okay, but it will likely thrive. South Korea, on the other hand, can say no such thing. South Korea's destiny is in very perilous hands with the United States. And it is showing how the United States' continued war on Korea through the Korean War, which is still ongoing, armistice does not mean peace, still has a huge impact today. And now that South Korea's government is on this puppet trajectory, we can expect that there will be major unrest in South Korea, as well as major consequences for regional stability. And, and that's the reality. But it will not change. Just like Ukraine, the conflict will not change the trajectory for Russia overall or for the or for the world. So too will this not change many things other than the status of that government, the situation internally in the country, and the level of danger that has now been brought forth to the region because of the U.S. and South Korea's puppetry. But the overall multipolar world order and the development of it, that's not going to change. South Korea just won't be a party to it. But we have to watch closely because we might see a different tune start to be sung. It might, it might be less American pie and more Sun Tzu uh, 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 when the um, SHIT hits the fan for South Korea. Because this is not something that's necessarily new. Over the last couple of years under Yoon, uh, South Korea has talked a big anti-China game, but has ultimately decided to invest in, and work closer with China. Let's see if that has truly changed and Biden and the White House has truly been able to secure a, a, a total vassal in this way. I don't think so, but we'll see. We'll see. Anyway, folks, that is it for the content for tonight. So we still have 1,100 viewers, 1,174, 1,174. Thank you for all those likes. We are at the pace we like. Um, I'm going to give this plug one more time before I get to the um, super chats and uh, some of the announcements. I want to let you all know that my birthday is in one week, and that's no reason just to give me money. But the goal uh, on my birthday is actually to upgrade the equipment for this channel. Um, it's very expensive. And I also have people who are doing volunteer labor for me. I'm trying to compensate to a greater degree. That's why I'm trying to build up things like Patreon. So uh, on Patreon, please do become a yearly member if you can, because it will go a long way to keeping this sustainable, helping me make these equipment upgrades and help me keep doing this work that I enjoy so much, but I believe is important to all of you, hopefully, and uh, just important in general to the overall world situation. And, um, you know, I want to continue and I want it to grow and I want it to thrive. So, um, you know, it's a real need for this channel because uh, equipment is expensive and inexpensive equipment actually goes pretty fast, right? It, it doesn't last very long. And so I'm in kind of that situation right now. So subscribe on Patreon, the link in the description. You can do that annually. Um, I will, of course, be on again before my birthday. So thank you for the super chats and birthday wishes. And I'll get to you guys very soon. But um, 
you know, there's Patreon. Of course, subscribe for free on Substack. Go to my link tree as well for one-time donation options. Subscribe for free on Substack for notifications. Telegram is also in my link tree as well. Um, but be sure there are one-time options uh, in the link tree, PayPal, Cash App, and um, you know you can subscribe annually on Substack. And you have, there's annual memberships on Patreon now. I was finally granted that privilege from this incredibly annoying platform, but it's the one that has my biggest community. So I appreciate all of you who are either Patreon members in the audience um, or uh, Patreon going to become Patreon members. I appreciate all of you. So let's get to some announcements, actually. How about we do that first before we start chilling for like 15, 20 minutes? How about that? We can get a good chill session. I'll need to charge my computer and it uh, can get a little dicey audio-wise. So let's get to the announcements before there might be any issues there and I have to reload. I want to let you know, to Monday, I am going to be on Reporterify Media with, um, with Alex, a great friend of the show. I'm going to be on his program at 9 a.m. Uh, actually, I think that's up. Uh, uh, so you can actually notify yourself on Reportify Media. Let me actually pull that up for you. I can send it in the chat. Um, so you want to, you, you can attend, it's definitely attend that. I'm not going to be streaming on this channel, but I do hope to clip it up and post on this channel um, as well. Okay. So Reportify, there's the link now in the uh, uh, chat. And um, that will be Monday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern time, 9 p.m. Beijing time. And I'll be on with Brian Berletic and Alex from Reportify Media. It should be fun. Um, and then the next time I'm going to stream, guys, it's going to be a little bit. It'll be late next week, likely Thursday or Friday. Um, Saturday, I have a standing um, May 6th, the standing um, guest, Brian Berletic, who comes on monthly for me. Uh, he's been great and generous with his time. And I'm going to start going on his streams as well. So Brian Berletic will be on Monday, May 6th, the day before my birthday. So it'll be a big, nice conversation to have before my birthday. So he'll be on. And I'm working on some other really cool guests. I just haven't gotten the confirmation yet. Um, I'm working on Fred Mbembe, who's the Socialist Party of Zambia president. I'm working on getting him. There may be a chance that's happening Friday, but I am going to let you all know. I'm going to talk about Africa, the situation, multipolarity. He was just in Beijing at this conference. He was in Russia recently. We're going to talk about all of that. Definitely want to talk to him about all of that. Um, I'm working on Mick Wallace, the uh, MEP over at the uh, EU, you know, the European Union. Um, that may be a while from now. Hopefully I'll have Richard Wolf back on. Um, so I'm working on some things, okay? Working on some things here for this channel. Um, and another big announcement, I have now increased my relationship with China Global Television Network. I've always been an opinions contributor. And they've been very generous in paying one of the most decent rates for columns when I'm able to write them. Um, so China Global Television Network, I've always been a, a, a opinions contributor. And so now I am working on a special commentator basis for them. So uh, they are actually going to be using some of this content and material to share with their um, audiences. I'll be writing up some first voice columns for them as well. And um, maybe even directing some shows collaboratively with them. So it's very exciting. Um, they've been very generous. Uh, really, uh, the entire Chinese media landscape, or, or at least not the entire, but um, the English language media that's most well known out in the in the West, has been very generous with um, supporting my work. And so, some of you who may hear this, who are brainwashing with the anti-China, new Cold War. Uh, neocon dogma might say, oh, well, that makes you state-affiliated media. No, this is all my choice. They don't censor me. I write what I want. I say what I want. I cooperate with them how I want. They just are willing to support and willing, and willing to expose my work to both Chinese audiences and foreign audiences that uh, follow Chinese media. And so 
why wouldn't I take that opportunity? Uh, it, plus, they're incredibly generous, and it's not monetary. Uh, uh, they pay me a little bit, but it's not uh, it's not a, a job. It's not a full time job. It is really a partnership, and so I really appreciate real, genuine partnerships where it's like, well, you have something you can offer, and they are generous in working with me. Not many places are willing to work with you based on your life. Um, the Collective West Media does not pay attention to work that I do. They, pro I'm probably on some blacklist somewhere, maybe many. Um, I'm not on that Maritoba tit list yet, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I'm connected and adjacent to a lot of folks that are. So, with all that said, it's like, why would I take the opportunity? I, I'm glad, and I and I and I am not afraid to say that China Global Television Network has been very easy to work with. Um, I, I have a lot of autonomy to do what I want with them. And, you know, I'm glad to support their efforts to promote a different picture of China than what you hear in the Western media. And uh, I believe in it. I believe in the message. Um, I've experienced it firsthand. I'm going to experience it more uh, when I travel back. And, um, you know, I, and I have many connections now on the mainland that I find very dear. To me, so so this is all uh, very great um, for me, and I'm so happy that I do have that opportunity, you know. And, and it also helps this channel; it helps all the work that I do. And so I wanted to let you know about that um, because I, I think you all should know. But with all of that said, you know, <laughs> it's not a job. I'm not like a full time. Uh, uh, I don't work full time for CGTN. So it really is still me operating on an independent basis with a little bit of extra support and help. Um, and, and it's mainly me honestly supporting them with them, you know, being so generous to allow me to use some of the content here to be promoted in their, um, in their venues and their, their mechanisms and channels. So with all that said though, be sure, you know, to continue to support this work. Okay. Um, I'm on equipment overhaul. I got to get to these super chats now because you all are sending me some generous ones as I work toward replacing my computer is going to be a big one because I got to get a good one now with the amount of work that I do on it. So um, I got to replace this computer. I'm already getting like vlogging equipment for when I travel in June. Um, hope to do a great event with Carlos Martinez, which will be streamed here. You better believe it. So I want to, I want to get that going when I'm in London and then hopefully, you know, I won't be working, working, working while I'm out there, but I, I will be hopefully getting you some good stuff while I'm out there. If I can learn how to do it, get the equipment, but you know, I got to replace this computer and then hopefully some other miscellaneous things, the lighting, et cetera, that I can work toward. Uh, but the computer is the big cost. And so thank you so much for all who have contributed, whether on Patreon, on Substack, uh, one-time donations, um, and of course, all the Super Chats, which I will get to right now. Oh, the chat has been very fast. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you. Put it towards equipment, you say. I appreciate it, and I will. Thank you so much. Although YouTube does not pay you out until... <laughs> they don't pay me out until the end of each month. Um, for the previous month. So it's it's really inconvenient, but it is what it is. Uh, but thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate all of this. This will go a long way. Thank you so much, Marta, for the happy birthday wishes. I, I am so appreciative to be living another year on this earth. So I'm going to do this really quickly. I want to, uh, well, maybe, I don't know. It's hard with YouTube. I don't want this stream to get censored or anything like that. So I may not play it, um, actually. But uh, my dog's making funny noises right now. He's in deep slumber. Um, but, you know, I can take some questions. Uh, and, oh, I forgot to show you the graphic. Oh, well, uh, you get it. China is militarily encircled. Um, let's see. Any other Super Chats? I know there are a lot. Uh, I want to just say Welcome Valley um, member. Here, thank you. I saw. Uh, I think I shouted you out earlier in the stream, but I want to shout out all the members who are here. I won't pull up the chat just because it's a random comment, and I know you're in discussion with folks. So um, let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. Party life. Thanks so much again for becoming a member. 
Uh, Marta said again, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for another super chat. <laughs> Two. I'm going uh, from bottom to the top, all right? So that's why it's a little... Uh, you might be hearing your super chat at the end, even if you gave it first. All right, folks. All right. Oh, here's a super sticker from Eddie C. Appreciate it, Eddie. Appreciate it. Oh, I'm running out of a lap. See, I need a new laptop. I'm already out of battery. I was at full power and I'm out. Um, that's a sign that you need a new device. So, um, it's only been a couple hours, but you know, this is hard on, on devices that aren't built for it. So that's why I'm getting a new one. That's why I say Patreon, Substack, please. Annual memberships are great, and you only have to pay one time for a year. Patreon and Substack, but you can keep up. You can be a, a, a continuous contributor while also just paying one time. It's like a gift once per year. And, and if you think about it, if you do the, there's a discount. If you do the five dollar option on Patreon, it's fifty seven dollars per year. You're talking about what? Divide that by 12 months. It's a very small amount. Very small amount. Talking about uh, $5 per month. How much is that per day? Divide that by 30. You're talking about a very small amount per day. I can't even do that math. Christopher, thank you so much. Christopher Lai, appreciate the super sticker. Appreciate it. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh Thank you, 913 people. We're still here. Oh, I forgot the Rockfin community. Um, appreciate you. Not a lot of comments here on the Rockfin community, unfortunately, um, except for a mean one. Oh, oh no. I thought you were referring to me. Tamara, I know that you're a, a, a very... Um, you've donated to the to the work before. I thought you were calling me a little NAZI clown. No, you were calling Alensky that. Okay. Um, appreciate you. Appreciate the whole Rockfin community. <laughs> Things that got lost in translation, just like text messages, right? Things that got lost in translation. Oh, here's a good one by Parnav Simha. Thanks for all of my work. Thank you. Thanks for all of your work. I can feel the collapse of the American economy in my own life. 11% of the company I work at got laid off. Scary times. Oh, I know what that feels like. I know what that feels like. It is it is very scary. Um, I hope, Pranav, I really appreciate your support. I, I hope that you're able to find some stability, uh, whether it's at this job or another, in, in your livelihood, because uh, I know how that worrisome that is when you feel like you're on the chopping block. I remember when I witnessed an entire agency close that I worked for, I, I'm a social worker by trade. Um, I remember when I was working at an agency for, for Butkus, like 28K a year, like literally the, the worst living standards I could imagine. But the whole agency closed just on a whim because of funding issues. It was very quick. And I remember what that was like. It was really rough. Um, I remember leading up to it, the worry, the nervousness, there was all these rumors and no one was being transparent, of course, in the uh, board or the executive director or, you know, those who manage the agency. And so it was very scary times. And, and I wish you well, I really do. Um, no American can tell the difference. Th and thank you for the super chat. But uh, La 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 69 says no American can tell the difference between a Ukrainian and a Russian. It's all the same trash for them. So they have no interest to end it while profiteering. Yes, la la la, 69, you're right. Thank you for the five euros. Appreciate it. Um, that's exactly right. This, look, I know when racism is talked about in the US and the collective West, it's considered wokeism a lot now these days. I, I, I would like to think that's a little more complex than that sometimes. Uh, of course, when it comes to the liberal establishment and the neoliberal and, and neocon establishment, yeah. It is politicized, but it's very real, both internally and externally. And when we look at externally, externally, everyone, thank you, Aloha, of course, for your support and for uh, putting that out there as one of the moderators. But not only this, it's a it's it's a race war. Uh, all U.S. wars, all wars by NATO are race wars. Russia, Ukraine, they're not human. To the United States and the collective West. They're not human to them. We have to understand that. They're not. All right. They're not human to them. So 
Um, before I get to the next super chat, as you hear the lovely siren in my community, uh, before I get to the next super chat, I'm just going to plug this in and give me a quick sound. Well, I'm not going to be able to check the sound, but but bear with me. I'm going to plug in. Hopefully, it doesn't do any issues to my audio. Let me know if so, um, and I'll whatever reload after the super chat comments. These aren't, you know, I don't, I don't know if any people in the playback are going to be. Uh, uh, watching me go over the super chats. So um, bear with me here as I try to get to the rest. Uh, we have a super sticker from Suyuri. Appreciate you. Um, all right. All right. We're getting to the beginning, last half hour of the show now. Wow. The chat was on fire. Appreciate all you lovely people. We had a lot of fun, um, I believe, already. So Let's see. Okay. Oh, God. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, one of my, uh, someone I look up to in the marathon streaming world is um, Richard Medhurst, a friend of the show. He's been on this program. I've been on his. And I'm always impressed on how he can go for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> and now I've become one of those folks who goes like two hours at minimum to cover what I cover. Um, Susan, Britain Sailor, you're a member and you want to create a soup chat. Where can I do it? Usually at the bottom, there's a dollar sign. I hope that you saw it, but thanks you for being a member. Appreciate you. And you know what you can do, Susan, if you're still on and you can't figure out the super chat thing, in the comments, you can leave a comment and leave a super thanks. That's also true for everyone on this stream. If you want to leave a super thanks, that's another way to support the work um, too. They give you that option now on YouTube. So thank you, Voltaire Duterte. Appreciate that contribution. All right. Anyone else? We're getting to the beginning. Yes, we have another super chat or super sticker from Valley. Uh, one of my favorite, well, I'm not going to pick favorites here of members, but you are a, a near regular here and your uh, support has been very much appreciated. And uh, thank you so much. Janine, a member said solidarity to you and all from North Carolina. Welcome Janine from North Carolina. Thanks so much for tuning in. I appreciate you. And I appreciate that, that, um, contribution. All right, I think we are done with those super chats, super stickers, etc. We're at the top now. Let's go to the bottom. It's getting late, so the fun may uh, have to be cut short. So I, I, I'm going to just chill out here. Let's do like a couple minutes of just chilling. Uh, let me put this up. Let me let me kick back. Uh, can I kick back? This microphone stand is annoying because it's I can't get it any shorter. Um. Let's see. Can you all hear me? Blah, 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 blah. All right. Um, don't feel you burn yourself out. <laughs> Violence says I can't talk for hours. Um, people say I still sound good. I might sound a little quieter because I'm chilling. Um, so, yeah. All right. Let's see. <laughs> 60 cents a day, said Joe W. So it's just 60 cents per day to sign up for the $5 per month or $57 per month annual on Patreon. So pretty cheap, pretty cheap. You can suggest guests. You can um, you can uh, suggest questions. Also, I had a really interesting experience. I love this. I actually love doing this for folks. So if you subscribe $5, $10, 20, I think at 25, I don't know what the tiers are. I forget. If you surprise for any of these tiers, um, you can also hit me up and just like, if I have some time, I will, if there's suggestions, things you want to talk, you know, things, resources you want, or somebody came with like a PhD question, they're doing a PhD application. They're like, can you just look this over? What do you think? Um, what are some resources I might be able, they're doing it on, on, you know, broadly on the U S S military strategy. I'm not gonna, that's just, that's just a, uh, paraphrasing. It's much more complex than that, but you know, do you have any resources, et cetera? Um, 
so yeah, I'm just going through this chat now. You know, <laughs> America die, hurry up and die. <laughs> Um, I'm not trying to burn myself out. I've been on a lot recently. It's actually helped me because as you all know, I've also been going through like my wife, um, you know, family loss in her family. And, uh, you know, it's been rough. It's always rough when you have loss in the family death. So, uh, it's actually helped recently to just get back onto a routine while also giving myself space. I try not to just go, go, go anymore, although I got to tell you, that's hard for me. I am a go, go, goer, if you didn't know that already about me, uh, whether you remember me from my writing weekly days, uh, those were also very intense, and uh, I used to, I'll tell you a funny story. Yeah, I'm a social worker by trade. I work for many agencies, and hopefully none of my supervisors will ever hear this, but um, yeah, I used to, I used to find, you know, I used to find time to, to do this work, you know, on my breaks. Uh, I'll put it at that. I'll just say I did it on my breaks because <laughs> then I just realized I don't want anybody to hear this. So, um, but you get the picture, right? I'm a go, go, go. I like, I love doing this work. I think it's important and I put a lot of time into it. So, you know, a couple of years ago during the pandemic, I was like, Let's try to get compensated. Let me try to, to to put more effort into this work, make it easier on myself. Not because I want to get rich or build a media empire. I'm not doing that. You don't see me. I'm not like changing my political orientation, all my politics. I did rebrand, but not because my politics are changing, but because I felt like it needed a new look. I felt like the name was not something I really wanted to keep forever and ever. Appreciate all of you who like the name who liked the former name, The Left Lens. Um, and I didn't have huge problems with it, but I had enough where I felt like it was time to change and um, the look too. So so thanks for all who were a part of that. But, um, but you know, I'm not in this to build a big media empire, but I am looking to make sure the audience, you know, I do expand the audience that I am reaching. Um and, you know, looking for collective mechanisms to do that. That's why I do bring on guests. That's why I am trying to cooperate with more like-minded people. It's unfortunate that on the left, you know, some people have asked me, hey, Danny, how come you don't have a lot of people on the left on your show? I would like to say that that's not true. I do have people on the left on my show, uh, Loki and... Um, Ali Abunima would both consider themselves on the left. They just wouldn't consider themselves on the left in the way that the left is generally defined in the United States and the West. And there have been many others too. Uh, Richard Wolf, Claire Daly. I, I don't, you know, I don't think you can call these folks not on the quote unquote left, but they're just what I call legitimate left. And yes, I don't just relegate my channel to only on the left because guess what? I can't, there are not that many. There are not that many. And then, when you talk about, I want to do regular cooperation, not many are willing to do that. And I got to say, there are many reasons for that, some of which are not very tasteful. All right. Not very tasteful. I don't throw people under the bus. I don't play sectarianism. I don't say this person's doing that to me, that person's doing that to me. But I could if I wanted because I know, I, look, I talked to you about my personal experiences in the workplace, in my life. I could say that my personal experiences in the movement has been a lot of sectarianism a lot of like why are you treating me like that like why why aren't you wanting to work with me is this why are you so competitive with me without you know it's like gaslighting it's like we're all in this competition but you know you're like competing with me but you're not going to say it and you're going to pretend you know that it's not happening there's a lot of that there's a lot of that in the movement it's very unfortunate and it happens in this media space too and so if you think I, I really do love when Patreon members and YouTube members and Substack suggest guests and then come back and, and then I, I have to tell them. With some of them, I have to say, look, I've reached out a lot. I've even reached out for like cooperation mutually. Like I don't just say, hey, come on my show. I also say, hey, do you, you know, do you want like to do cross collaboration, et cetera? Generally, if the person you suggest or the person you're thinking of is not on my channel. It's because they either don't get back 
or they respond in the negative or there's something even bigger going on, right? So just know that everything is political, right? And unfortunately, we're in a situation where cooperation isn't always so easy. That's just the reality. And so, yeah, I cooperate with folks that want to cooperate who share like-minded views on issues important to me. And they may not always have, uh, you know, they may not always, I might not always agree with them on everything either. And, and, and so Sherry, new member, hey, oh, oh, okay. I, I, I want to I shout you out. Sherry is a new member. Thank you so much for becoming a member of this channel. But I want to just shout that out because I've had some people, I, I have some people leave my Patreon, for example, saying, hey, you didn't have these guests. Hey, you're, you're not talking to anyone on the left. I can't control that. <laughs> people have to be willing. Like I'm trying to invite the so pr president of the Socialist Party of Zambia. He lives in Zambia for Mbembe. I can't control that the time zone is ridiculous. Like I'm trying. Same thing with like a Mick Wallace. He's on the left. I'm trying so hard, but time zone is not good. Um, if you have anyone else in mind and I've already reached out to them, just know that it's not it's not the fault of maybe it's not the fault of anybody. Sometimes people are just busy. But there's also this dynamic you you've got to be aware of. I mean, I'm sure you all are aware of this dynamic just by consuming content, right? You just see it, right? Why don't certain people go on certain shows? Why is there no real collaboration between certain channels? Well, that's a good question. I would like to think that I'm not part of the problem because I constantly reach out. Even when I had that row with Jackson Hinkle, I, I mean, now like it's neither here nor there. I don't, I don't think anything of this, but I was like, all right, well, let's have a conversation on my channel. If you want to have a conversation on your channel and it didn't happen. Okay. And that's it. Now it's like, you know, water under the bridge. It's like, you know, do your thing and I'll do my thing. And, you know, I'm not really, not really into that grudge thing. I'm too old for all that. So it's like, you know, do you and I'll do me. But that's when it comes to like the quote unquote left people, you know, I would say people who consider themselves socialists or God forbid communists or, you know, people left of the Democratic Party. We have a big problem on that side of the spectrum. I would consider myself on that side for the most part. For people on that side of the spectrum, not a lot of cooperation going on. All right. And it's a big problem. It is a big problem. So if you are thinking that's a big problem, I agree with you. Um, and I'm not perfect either. You know, I can self criticize. I know that I get so busy and it's enough just trying to get these solo streams going um and to figure out a kind of plan and course of action that works both for the channel and for myself and for the movement and for you know it's hard to balance all those interests at the same time and sometimes it's not possible and so you know we just do our best and so that's that's what i want to say we do our best but um got a fire truck going on i just stay on for a couple more minutes with all of you um, <laughs> whatever, man, when are you gonna have Hillary Clinton on your show? That would be actually really funny to me and really fun. Which <laughs> is a joke. I would love to troll Hillary Clinton on my show. Um, some people said Brian is also kind of a leftist. I don't know if he would call himself that because I know he's against labels. But yeah, we agree on a lot of really key things. Uh, Radhika Desai, and Michael Hudson, yes, I've had them on my show. I, I think they would consider themselves on the left. Hudson and Desai both consider themselves socialists. They dropped a new video today on geopolitical economy. Um, I think that's what you're talking about. Uh, anything at all? Yeah. <laughs> a two siren show. Nice. It doesn't. Um, you know, sometimes I'm shocked that there aren't more. But it is quite late on a Saturday. So I guess folks are, if it's during the day, it's way more than two during the day, way more. So that's why I don't even like streaming during the day. Cause it's like, ugh, gross. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, anyway, I got to say RIP to the, to the goat, uh, Harry Belafonte. I got to say RIP to the go ahead. Harry Belafonte, incredible person. This dude, um, this dude, Harry Belafonte, a giant, 
and he was anti imperialist. He was anti empire. This guy, I mean, he was in Venezuela during the Bush administration. He was solidarity with Africa all throughout his career with the revolutionary governments in Africa, the independent governments of Africa um, in the early 50s, in the 60s. Um, incredible person, politically. Uh, uh, rest in power to the GOAT, Harry Belafonte. Big loss. I just got to say that. Big loss. Um, but he lived a long and fruitful life and, and really did pave the way on so many issues, including the global, but also, of course, uh, the domestic struggle for uh, uh, black freedom. You know, just incredible stuff. Incredible, incredible stuff. Um, so uh, rest in power to the GOAT, Harry Belafonte. Some people talk about Jerry Springer. I won't call him the goat of nothing, but you know, look, I was a kid back in the day, and and, and I gotta say, I did watch a lot of Jerry Springer. Uh, I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> no one's perfect, right? <laughs> Jerry Springer is some debaucherous stuff. It's some, uh, you know, what's funny about Jerry Springer? I learned this about him as I was looking up stuff about Jerry Springer. This dude was like an RFK surrogate. Uh, for Robert F. Kennedy, like he worked in his campaign, I guess, and he was also the mayor of Cincinnati. You had Nina Turner shout him out hilariously because he was the mayor of Cincinnati. She's a you know she's a congresswoman from Ohio, but um, not going to call Jerry Springer the goat though because that's a tragic. I mean, regardless of the limitations of kennedyism and liberalism, um, it is a pretty stark downfall from that to uh, Jerry Springer show. Um, but yeah, so party life said Jerry Springer was actually pretty left. Yeah, he was, he was, but that media debacle, but look, that was a product of the nineties. We can't say that Jerry Springer was the only program on that corporate media SHIT show landscape during that period, the wild nineties. I mean, the media mergers and monopolization led to like, it was already happening and occurring, but then the mergers created like this this explosion of the most debaucherous disgusting television i grew up on all of that so you know i'm damaged goods <laughs> i'm damn it we're we're all not better for it of course mentally and whatever but it's the world we lived in of part of that exploding neoliberal era and um you know i'm not gonna you know <laughs> but jerry springer was funny people say he was funny um, yeah, I'm not going to stomp on him. It was an unfortunate show though. I'm not going to, uh, as people say, he was just a tool. Yeah. I mean, that was a lucrative job, man. You're making money on that job. That, that, <laughs> um, Danny got to catch up to Ben's chant. Yeah. Ben is killing it. Ben Norton is killing it creative. Um, but unlike some other folks though, I don't see Ben's growth as competitive. Like, I hope we're complimentary. I know we we kind of do things a little differently. So um, I'm not like setting my stand. You know, it'd be great to do that, but um, because it would mean we're all reaching more people. But but good on Ben. Good on Ben. You know, good on everyone who's growing, who's doing good work. Um, but, you know, hey, look, third siren, everybody. Third siren. <laughs> third siren of the show. Luckily, none of them came during the... Um... Jesus I got to say, I live in a building and it's an old building and you know what it's like to be, if you are a working class person, you know what it's like to live in a working class community in an, a residential building. If you live in the cities and you know that not only is the f infrastructure just not great, you know, but you also have people who are kind of like struggling with stuff. And I got to say that sometimes I'm like scared that some one of those fire sirens are for my building. <laughs> okay. So um, it's not, oh, it's not always just like, oh, funny sirens. I'm sometimes I'm like, oh, God, sirens. Like, does that mean there's a fire truck coming? Um, Desert Manta says, suggestion, Danny, you need to arrange, rearrange the books on your bookshelf to keep the viewers interested. Wow. That's interesting. You know, my camera has this intense focus and I really don't know how to, I'm not a camera expert, so I, I really don't know how to get it all in focus. I don't even actually know if there's a setting on this incredibly nice camera that will do that. But um, the lens is hard to use for me. And so I, I got you. 
I hear you. I, I really do, Desert, and I and I appreciate all of your support and moderation. So I hear you. I hear I really do. Um, I'm gonna think about that next time I'm on. All right, late next week. So if you can truly see these books, then yeah, maybe I should switch it up a little bit. Especially um, my book, you can probably see pretty flush, even if it is a little blurry. Uh, but you got Han Su Yin's book, Eldest Son. You got Fan Shen up there. You got that blue book right there is on um, Iran Contra. Ugh, the Marxism is all being covered. It's all here. Marxism. You got some Lenin's imperialism there. I think you got um, anti Durkring. Dur I don't know how to pronounce that. You got what is to be done. That's what is to be done right there. All right. So um, that's that's some of my books. I can just see from the screen, even blurry. So yeah, we're just chilling now. It's eleven thirty-three. I should probably go to sleep. On my wife's out of town. I'm I'm sleeping in tomorrow. So. I'm chilling. I got to do these timestamps after though, which is going to be a pain in the butt. But I, I do want um, <laughs> Majin. Oh my gosh. Majin Vegeta. That is an incredible handle. I salute you. I salute you because Majin Vegeta is one of the most incredible Dragon Ball characters. Um, And for all those who think watching anime is some kind of soy stuff or whatever if you're like on all that immature weird stuff get out of here anime is like embraced by a lot of oppressed communities a lot of working class people so just miss me with all of that like miss me with all of that anime photo all right if you're on twitter like just too much and you're into like the ooh the anime photos the anime pick is like so lame and liberal then you're just on twitter too much because majin vegeta your not only your name but your comment really makes me happy so thank you <laughs> the sirens of the battle is no danny is a real mf journalist m, 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 m effort journalist some not some grifting mf living in the hamptons oh no i do not live in the hamptons i live in the uh uh h-o-o-d um that's where i live i don't live in some like flat in la or whatever wherever some folks be living with their own studios and stuff i don't I don't got that luxury right now i mean i'm not trying to live that luxurious but i you know a nice room for a studio would be cool would be cool so that's why i asked for patreon support i don't think that's too much to ask to have a, a room where i can do this um because you know I, my camera's all the way over there i can't get it but if i could i would show you that this is really just my living room <laughs> it's one side of it it's one side of it i got my dog sleeping really hilariously in like a hilarious position over there and then the windows are right there and i live on uh, a major street so that's why you hear all the sirens because they're coming from a major and one of the biggest streets in new york um and uh yeah and so it's not the hugest place all right uh so yeah Desert Mantis says, so yeah, but, but, but uh, back to Vegeta, Majin Vegeta, great character. So, so chilling. Like that was a chilling um, saga. That really was not the best one, but chilling in the Dragon Ball Z series. Um, Desert Mantis says they have Hansu Yin's The Morning Deluge. Yeah, I heard she has really great, like, I mean, quote unquote, fictional writing, po like kind of poetic writing. Um Joe WS, you should encourage people to give subscriptions to your channel. It's very effective. Yeah, I should. I forgot. <laughs> so for the 70, 776 people here, if you are so generous, give subscriptions to some of our lovely people still here. Um, that would be great. A lot of folks have left. I should have said it earlier. Next time. Next time. Maybe when Brian is on the show, I can make that like a birthday thing. Um or maybe when I do my individual, I might do an individual stream before that. Majin Vegeta says they love. Some people said Sailor Moon. Sailor Moon was a good show. I watched that as a kid when I was young, and I don't remember a damn thing. So maybe it's time to rewatch. Um, yeah, I like anime, but I only have like right now. I would say uh, I, I need to finish Attack on Titan. Um, I got out of it. Oh, they wanted me to show you my dog. Uh, um, all right. I'll make that happen before I leave here tonight. I'll, I'll take a, 
what I'm going to do is uh, I'll get up. I'll try to twist my camera. It's It has this battery in it that makes it a little hard to twist. Um, but I'll try to twist it around for you. Um, you just won't be able to hear me because my mic is far from the can. It's a whole setup. But yeah, I'll show us the dog. I'll show. He might get up if I do that and get scared. He gets a little scared by the... Um, oh, I had John Pilger on. He's a leftist. <laughs> I hate that I have to prove that I'm a leftist. Get out of town with all that nonsense. Um, bring out the puppy. <sighs> You're really... Uh, okay, I'll bring out the puppy. Hold on one second. How many orbits around the sun, Danny? Oh, jeez. Stop. <laughs> so Joe da OWS says he'll remind me. Yes, you're a moderator, right, Joe? Um, thank you so much. Yeah, do remind me. I should be able to see from here, actually. I believe you're a moderator, right, Joe? Oh, uh, da, 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 da. I believe you're a moderator. Yeah, you are a moderator, Joe. So yeah, thanks for moderating and let's do it. Um, all right, it's been fun in this chat. It's been fun, but we're getting late. And show us your left cards, lol, <laughs> violin. Yeah, I can't stand it. I mean, I could go on for days about the stuff that I've done and I've talked about it in my articles and in past streams. And and yet still you have people. I mean, I get it. It's like, what have you done for me lately? People come on. They don't know your work. You know, they send you messages and you're like, why? Like, why are you sending me that message, man? Like, you know, I'm already going through a tough time. And so that's the one hard thing about content creation is that I really appreciate all of your support. And I really do want you to engage. But just know I'm going to try to make the engagement manageable for me. Um, because it's important to have those boundaries. But, um, you know, but sometimes it's like when you're doing not so good, like those boundaries are harder to keep. And so when you see something, you're just like, Ugh, it can affect you in a, in a bigger way. So I hate that card carrying leftist stuff. You know, it's like, now, a lot of the people who are either doing that like passive aggressively or just aggressively, to me, that's not legitimate. That's not legitimate. Like, who who are you to hold anyone accountable? You're not, what do you, you know, like, let's let's hold each other accountable. How about that? How about a new approach? A new approach. Um, show your dog, Danny. I'm stalling. I'm stalling. All right. I'm going to put the be right back on card. I'm going to twist the camera. I'm going to come back and I'm going to un- do the be right back card. All right. This is a good, good time to use the be right back card. Um, all right. Where am I? Oh, here we go. All right. I'll be back. Stay tuned for Eugene Debs the dog. <laughs> Eugene. All right. I'll be right back. Okay. All right. I'm back. And you might be able to see him there. It's not a great picture because he's a little out of focus. A little out of focus there. You might be able to hear me better now. But the tripod is quite tall. I don't want to move it too much because it's plugged into a battery. And I'm moving it a lot. But uh, there you go. There he is. There's my plate. <laughs> There's my plate. I was eating before this. Uh, don't worry. It'll be washed. Uh, but there he is <laughs> sitting in his spot on the couch. He got up, he was in his bed right there, but then he got up because he saw the camera moving and he does not like the camera, doesn't like the tripod, but there you go. There is Eugene. He is very peaceful, usually very peaceful at this time, all times, all times. He's a very peaceful dog. Uh, he's, uh, I don't know if you all remember, but, um, he was a handful when I first got him when we first got him, but he is very much settled in now. He's really making rapid progress on really 
important things like separation anxiety. So for all those interested, that's the deal. Um, he's also, uh, um, you know, now we're trying to work on some of this play reactivity. I do a lot of dog training too. So if you thought I had more time than I do like leisure time, I really don't because I do focus a lot on this because it's all about, you know, I got to have a quality of life. I got to be able to leave. I got to be able to, you know, walk him in peace. And, but, um, when I say reactivity, I mean, he's just too playful, but we're working on that and, uh, it's been going good. He's a good dog. There he is. I'm just going to, I'm just going to put on the be right back card because I got to reorient this again and then I will see you soon. So there he is. There's Eugene. put these back on but i'm back for like a minute more because i should i should really get out of here um let's see what the comments were for eugene here um so <laughs> now that he knows that i have a couch <laughs> yeah 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 so um that's eugene i know it's a little dark because it's this apartment is dark as hell i i gotta say it, it there's no there's no lights up i mean this is i told you this apartment is like old and um, affordable for where I live. So just FYI, I mean, we don't have overhead lighting in this apartment. So it's annoying. Um, so let's see what do people say. Uh, he's camera shy. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so much cleaner than my room. Uh, okay, let's see. Doggo coming up. All right. So here we are. Some people sharing their dog stories. Uh, I'm a big dog person now. I'm like obsessed with Eugene. I uh, do. So unfortunately, unlike Katie Halper, who can put their dog in their lap, <laughs> Eugene is um, 50 pounds. And he I would call him a medium size to large dog. Um, he can actually make himself bigger and smaller depending on what he's doing. But uh, he's a at, at minimum a medium-sized dog so he ain't coming on my lap and there's not a lot of room for that either so that's why i showed you the way i did um people like him he's very cute he's i can show you some instagram uh i have i he yeah i can show you some pictures of him if you'd like but i should actually go um i've done that in the past um people are saying yay what a cutie cute <laughs> there's the puppy such a good boy he's a very good boy yes he is um, I got data on his breeds. Actually, there's like this Cornell thing where they take genetic stuff. I, I had my questions about it, but I was like, I really want to know. So I did it. Uh, he's actually 30% plus pit bull. The next biggest is a uh, surprise, surprise Siberian Husky. And then he's a bunch of shepherds, Australian shepherd, German shepherd. And, um, then he's like a super mutt. It's like no, the super mutt's the next biggest. So super mutt just means like a bunch of different things, and they don't actually know how many. They know some of them, and I can't remember their names. So that's the next biggest percentage: pitbull, that, then Siberian husky, then Australian shepherd, then German shepherd. It's like he's a lot. He's a lot of stuff, um, which is great. Who keeps him when you go to China? So I didn't have him when I went to China. We're gonna go to Europe. Um, very nervous about it. We're going to go to Europe for like two and a half weeks, three weeks. We have to board him in a place that we trust for the most part, right? He's had some, we we take him to daycare there sometimes. He's they've, he's been walked there. We love it. He's, he's the person in the community. He does a really great job. But, you know, just like anything, dogs and dog care is, is a difficult job. And sometimes, you know, 
when Eugene gets nervous, he'll he would like chew stuff. So we have to keep him away from that. He doesn't like to play. He's a nervous player with chew toys. So we don't do it. And he doesn't really it's not like, oh, we got to do it. It's a myth. All of that's a myth. You don't have to do anything except, you know, be consistent with training and, you know, mental stimulation, physical stimulation. As long as your dogs get some of that, every dog is different. As long as you do that, you'll be good. And of course, focusing on the areas that, you know, could be dangerous if they're not trained out of. Um, so we do have a great place that we really do like. Um, but um still nervous about it. Still nervous about it, you know, because it's two and a half weeks. It's three weeks. It's a long time. So <laughs> very sweet pampered looking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, it's funny. I'm like, I pamper, but I'm very, I'm a disciplined parent. Like I, I'm, I'm the trainer in the family. Let's just say I'm the one who's like, this dog needs to know boundaries. Boundaries lead to freedom is my philosophy. I study it a lot. Um, and I get a lot out of it. It's great. So I, I'm getting a lot of cool comments here. Thanks for uh, dogs are amazing. Uh, <laughs> Katie Alper's dog couldn't scare a burglar. <laughs> my dog is so submissive. Um, who knows? Maybe if he felt like he was in danger from a person breaking in, maybe he would, uh, some of that instinct pit, maybe even some of that pit bull instinct would come up, but not really. I've never, I haven't really seen it. He's gone into one fight with one dog, but his submissiveness can turn into anxiety with dogs. That's why I try to be very careful about like daycare too often. Um, make sure I know which dogs are there. Cause I know the dog community at this place quite well. If it's a fit, if it's a match, he's very good. He loves to play with dogs, but I don't like him playing outside with dogs. I don't do dog parks. I'm anti dog park. I, I hope that doesn't hurt anyone's feelings, but I am anti dog park. I think that too many people do not come with dogs that are capable of being in those situations. And it just hurts the dogs, all of the dogs from the aggressive dogs to the submissive, all of them, they just get hurt by it because there's no guidance out there. They're not wild animals, you know, and I like Eugene had a bad experiences at dog parks, like German shepherds bullying him and stuff. And it's just gross. I had, I had guys driving out from Long Island. I wanted to, I, oh my God, like I, my anger comes out hard out there with people in their dogs. Cause you know, it. if you have dogs, you know, it, you know, these kind of folks, they, they are not, what's going on. I'm getting text. Oh, my wife, my wife. Um, you know, these type of owners, you know, they're just negligent or some of them are like training aggressive dogs or some of them are just like, they don't care and they just ruin the experience for everyone. So, you know, and they don't make it collaborative. Yeah. So I just stopped taking my dog. I'm not taking my dog. No dog parks, no more. That's it. <laughs> um, so yeah, the dog parks too rowdy. It's just, if your dog is like perfectly trained, okay, but even perfect, like, and there's no perfect, of course, but if your dog is capable with like great recall, which unfortunately Eugene does not have yet, I'm working on that. Great recall, uh, uh, um, great impulse control. His is getting better, but like, unless you have your dog has all those things, it still doesn't matter. Your dog is at risk because you don't know what other dogs going to do. And I've heard too many times from dog people that their like dog gets messed up at the dog park. Even their dog is well behaved, bad experience, and suddenly they're traumatized because yeah, they were put in front of in a situation that was bad. So look, if it works for your dog and you know the community and there hasn't been any issues, I'm not gonna say don't do it. But like for me, where I live in the city and where there's just like a lot of people who just aren't thinking about community. Nah, it's it's too much of a risk. It's way too much. So yeah, I don't have total recall as populist Gen Xers said. Not yet. Um, Desert Mantis says dog is PT. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, Eugene definitely has some of that too. Cause of, um, he was a shelter dog before I rehomed him from a home. And so, um, he definitely has some PTSD, you know, definitely some of that, but it, luckily he's been very resilient. I don't, it's not like terrible, but 
especially around like noises and stuff. Yeah, it can get rough for him. Um, yeah, somebody said no border. Yeah, no border collie there. There is some like border collie in or collie. It said like collie breed. They didn't know which kind, I guess, in the super mutt, but uh, mixed, but like very negligible, like two, three, four percent or something. So nothing big with thank God. Not to say border collies aren't great dogs, everyone. I don't live a life where I can be um, working a border collie. I don't, I can't work like Eugene has all of these breeds in him that are like super demanding. And I'm just so happy that he is not any one of them personality wise, like totally, you know, he's not a German shepherd. He's not an Australian shepherd um, where these dogs or like a border collie. They need their work dogs. Huh? Like they, they, they are laborers and they will labor on you if they cannot labor. So like, I am good. I live in the city. I live, you know, I have parks near me, but like, that's not enough, you know? And so I see the German shepherds in the community, for example. And I got to say, I stay away because I see just the intensity that they bring. And, you know, Eugene has some bad experiences with one of the dog park. And I'm just like, not to say, you know, German Shepherd can't be a great dog, but most people in the city just not equipped. They're just not equipped for that. You just say, aren't, you just aren't like they need to do something. They need to do something like all the time. And my apartment is like less, I don't even know, how, I don't know, less than 800 square feet. Like that ain't going to work. <laughs> that ain't going to work at all. Um, so anyway. I've been talking about dogs over and over and over again. Um, Arlene said, you agree with me? Yeah, yeah, right? I walk through the park twice a day. That's good enough for me. Yeah, me too. Twice a day. Like, I mean, he goes, he goes, like, I'm going to take him to go for like a second at night. And then in the morning, he needs to usually go uh, when he wakes up. But he gets two like longer walks in the middle of the day. And I split them up. Um so that that's enough for him man he's just sleeping the rest of the time he sleeps like we always joke about it here in the house we're just like sometimes my wife is like is he bored and i'm like well if he was bored he wouldn't be sleeping all the time you know he would be like what's going on let's do something you know i'm you know i'm restless blah 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 no he's never liked it. he just sleeps 14 hours 16 hours i mean nice life you know nice life um all right everybody <laughs> I love the comment. Now the CIA knows I have a couch. I love that comment. Um, <laughs> I do got a couch. You can thank my wife for any of that setup you saw. You can thank her for being a uh, incredible. Uh, she just has style. So she like she goes hard on that. And uh, I appreciate it because uh, I like comfortable and nice looking things too. It's just I've never had the eye nor the attention span or the interest so it works for me may day plans uh i wish no nah, i mean my wife's gonna be off uh i don't know if there's protests happening here it's a monday i got work i'm actually gonna be on brian berletic not brian berletic's channel but with him on reporter five's channel in the morning then i got work i got a couple of sessions in like weird times so not a lot of time to do stuff outside so i'll be in doing therapy um that's what i do part-time so uh style and class analysis quite a catch yeah no my wife i'm a very lucky person i'm a very lucky person she is both um a very she's very committed uh, person politically we share a lot of the same politics um <laughs> Dr. Nivier, where can you get a political commentary, pet talk, all which I could talk about dogs forever and ever because I literally, when I'm not doing studying for this or like trying to live some kind of like life, but I'm not embedded in the political commentary analysis, studying up. Um, when I'm not like trying to live my life with my wife and just like trying to be somewhat of a healthy person if I can. A lot of that time goes to, to to him because, you know, we're kind of in like a mode. I, I'm in a mode with him where it's like it's time. 
we had a really busy, hard situation when we first got him for the first six months or so. Couldn't really do that much with him other than like try to survive. And then after that, it was like trying to learn how to now raise a dog after he was basically not trained at all for a year and a half, um, whether he was in a shelter for six months or with another family who treated him well. It's just they didn't do anything, you know, suburbs, yard. They didn't do any training with him, no leash skills, nothing, no walking. He was just running around the yard with his other dog. Not good. So he had a lot of stuff to learn, and so it's been a lot. Um, so, yeah, I could do this if it was interesting. Um, actually, one thing I'm thinking about once I learn how to vlog, I would love to stream from out and about and um, if possible. And uh, just for like fun times, maybe special streams where I could uh, <laughs> where I could. Um, where I could have Eugene in the stream with me, you know, and just chill. Cause I also want him to learn how to chill outside because you know, there's a lot of distractions outside. It's the city. And I know, I know it makes him a little nervous sometimes, you know, he does really good. He's so much better now. Leash skills for me, at least there's still some work to do on the other side, but for me, like pretty impeccable other than, you know, if there's a dog around that I got to do one eighties, et cetera, I gotta, I gotta walk in my way. But, um, yeah. So I'm hoping to do some in real life streams where, yes, I am. I would love to do that because then I can learn how to, once I get this vlogging kit, I can learn, I can get out into the field too. And um, yeah, actually like from the Duran, yeah, I could do that. But also I could interview people as well. Um, I, I do hope to do that because I, I am now equipped with a phone that is much more able, which is why I need your support. Anyway, guys, I've been on for so long, three hours. This is the first time I've ever done that. And it's midnight now. And I'm like, oh, geez, I stayed up till midnight on this stream. Um, But I need to go. <laughs> it's been a marathon. It's been great. Thank you so much for everyone who stayed on. 645 people staying on. I mean, that's great. Just chill. Glad you all think so highly of me to chill with me this long. Um, yeah, I will be back. I will be back. When will I be back? Probably late next week for one stream on my own. Um, and then I will be um, with Brian Berletic May 6th. And then hopefully after May 6th, I will have... Uh, quite a few other guests spat scattered about the following weeks. It's just not confirmed yet, but I'm hoping for that. Um, if I get for Mememba on for Friday, it'll be Friday, Saturday, and I just won't stream until Friday, Saturday of of, um, of next week. All right. Thank you. Take good care. Salute. I will try to get some timestamps. Um, at the very least, the beginning of the video or maybe first content timestamp for all of you in the replay. Uh, good morning, everybody, if you're in the Eastern time zone um, or somewhere ahead of the Eastern time zone. And good night for anyone behind me. Take good care. And I will, um, I will see you soon. Bye-bye.